how to fix it. Let's see. See if this works. Hello, hello. So maybe we got to start again. I don't see anybody in the chat, so let me know if you're able to hear me and how you're doing, what you're thinking, where you are in the world in the chat. And uh, I think I just fixed the sound. We're going to talk about creating your first PAO list, which is person, action, object. So um, let me know who's familiar with that. Who has a PAO if you're joining us? And uh, if you uh, don't have one, let me know if you'd like to have a PAO if you're excited about that. If you're watching the replay, you can also um, let me know in the discussion below this video and uh, we will hear from you then. So uh, I love to answer all those chats from later. So please do uh, be involved and let me know uh, where you're at with remembering numbers and if you've had a PAO before. And uh, it's very, very simple. It's person, action, object. And what it does is it enables you to remember numbers very, very quickly because you're going to assign imagery two numbers in different ways. And we'll talk about some of the different ways that you can do this, the different kinds of uh, PAO systems that people have had and uh, what some of the different, what some of the different issues are with them so that you're able to create it quickly, decide which one you want to use, how you want to use it, who to ask if you have uh, questions about some of the different forms. I'll teach you the way that I do it, give you some solid examples that you can uh, learn from, put into action. And uh, basically what it does is lets you remember numbers a heck of a lot faster than you could without a PAO. And uh, it is a lot of fun. And we'll get some examples of people using it in action. But first I want to test that the sound is actually working. Let me know in the chat. If you're here, where you are in the world, what you're doing, that you're joining us. Had a little bit of a technical issue at the beginning. But uh, so that I'm not talking into space, I'd rather uh, restart this on a different time, fresh, knowing that things are working, than just uh, do a live stream into outer space to myself. So if you're here and you're joining us, let me know. And if not, then I guess I'll assume this is not the right time of day because this is the, uh, the not active crowd. And uh, we'll do it at the different time of day where all the active people show up. So uh, let me know in the chat before we get started and let's get rocking. So Paul is here. Thanks for saying hello, Paul. I really appreciate it. And uh, I assume that means you're hearing me because if you didn't, then uh, that uh, <laughs> that wouldn't have come through. And uh, oh, good to see Crone when we walk in, Renee. Good to always see you and uh, wonderful to have some of your updates. And I know that numbers is one of the things you're working on. And I was thinking about you when I put this together precisely for that reason, uh, in case you have any questions and so forth. Um, and uh, very good that you're here and good that everyone is uh, getting active. Always appreciate that. This is for you. That's why we have these calls for interaction. Believe it or not, there's good neurochemical reason to believe that uh, you're going to get more out of these sessions if you're active, if you're part of the discussion. And uh, later I might tease you all because I have something very, very special here. But if there's not enough chats, I don't know if I'll crank it out on this uh, particular session. So I really want to uh, reward interactivity and uh, possibly punish lack of it. <laughs> all right. So Anthony Morrison is here and he's not sure I'm on y'all level. Well, um, I don't know what, what level we're on, but the level involves fun. It involves being relaxed. It involves having joy and pleasure with memory techniques and constantly improving as we go throughout life. And, uh, you know, also being willing to make mistakes, learning about the power of mistakes. My mistake here, I didn't have the desk heighted properly, some kind of sound error going in and so forth, but we just run with it. We run with it. Um, great. So Anthony Morrison says, sounds good to me. It sounds great to me as well. So we're going we're gonna to talk more about what is a PAO li uh, list, but very, very simply, it is a list that you create of images that you're going to associate with numbers that has some sort of person, action, or an object 
but I'm going to suggest to you that it doesn't always have to have a person action object. There's context in which that's useful. There are contexts in which you can collapse them all into one. That's how I do it. I work progressively towards continuing to collapse them all into one. And that's for answering the question of what it does, which is to help you memorize numbers fast in ways that are easy and uh, effective and fun. And the more that I collapse the PAO into a singular uh, event, so to speak, mental memory event, the more fun and fast and effective that it gets. But the caveat is that I'm not a competitor, so we're going to talk about what some of the competitors do insofar as I'm knowledgeable about that and give you some resources to the things that they've said and that you can follow them up. And the links to those are down in the description below as well, and we'll cover them on today's session. So with that all said, let's get started with slide number one or two, as the case may be. Um, so one of the most famous ones is the Hotel Dominic also more popularly uh, known as Dominic System. And it is often, it's not versus the major in some sort of combative sense, but it's often, you know, cast uh, against uh, or as an alternative to the major. And the reason why is because the major is a, a and we'll talk about it in I'll teach it to you today if you don't know it, or it'll be a review for those of you who do. But the major is... A, what I would call a non-arbitrary means of creating your associations between your figures and your numbers. And there's something, to my mind, a little bit arbitrary about the Dominic system in that, even though in some of the ways that it's been taught, it, it has similarities that are not arbitrary, but I'm not entirely sure at the end of the day, because to be honest, I've never created a Dominic system because it never made sense to me. It seemed like way too much work. Uh, but to others... Those images that he suggests just make sense. And so I spoke with someone the other day, and I think he said that Charlie Chaplin was his 33. And when I've looked at the, like, I don't know exactly how that maps onto the Dominic system, uh, but he said it made sense for him. It's what he's always used, and it just clicked in his head, and almost all of them had clicked in his head. And this is like, go for it, brother. If that's what works, that's great. But it didn't make sense for me, and, and the major made a lot of sense. So that's one thing. And Really, what you want to do if you want to learn more about it is to read some of Dominic's books or uh, do research on the internet and so forth. To this day, I haven't really gotten through to him to get onto the Magnetic Mary Method podcast, but I never give up, and uh, we'll keep going with that uh, and hopefully make it happen one of these days because obviously he's a great inspiration and a great educator and also doing great things with bringing the uh, you know the the golden era of of an individual's life in in terms of being a an elder citizen of the global community bringing inspiration to other people that are in his demographic to also go and uh, in that age group go and compete and and learn about memory techniques and so forth so that's uh that's absolutely wonderful and i want to i want to pick his brain about about that and uh, encourage more people of that age to learn these techniques and dive in say hello to bola J. Shiva Shankar. Okay, are you related to Ravi Shankar, uh, perhaps? Uh, or maybe Shankar Acharya? That'd be cool. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for saying hello. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and where you're at with your PAO system. In any case, very, very interesting uh, to look at Hotel Dominic. Then you just have a variety of people who teach things like 00 to 99 or maybe 000 to 999 or 0000 to 9999. Um, that's very interesting. We'll talk about one in particular in a minute coming up. Then there's the Venn system, which we'll, we'll look at in a minute as well. Um, but the question is, really, how do you choose? How could you possibly decide what to choose? Obviously, I'm partial to certain things, um, but there are ways to make choices and... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some suggestions on which one to choose, but let me say uh, hello first to Ajinkya. Thank you so much for saying uh, that this is working for you, and yes, I will keep it up. Really appreciate you uh, taking a moment to, to, to pop, pop, pop that in, and uh, always good to see people uh, with their thumbs up. Love it, love it. All right, so... Um, Let's see here. Oh, Sidhart is here as well. Thanks for those thumbs up, Sidhart. And thanks 
for uh, the love from India. I really got to get to India. I mentioned Ravi Shankar here and Shankaracharya, and obviously those are signs of some interest that I have in India. One of these days I'll get down uh, up around to uh, see you all. I studied sitar for some years, uh, and my mind, uh, sorry, my Mizrab, the mind is the bend. Uh, my Mizrab apparently had been d d uh, dipped in the Ganges from my uh, my teacher, and uh, yeah, great stuff. <laughs> I missed the sitar. I need to get another one. All right. So how do you choose? How are you going to choose f between the different options? Well, first of all, ask yourself: Are you going to compete? If you're going to compete, then you want to talk to the memory competitors. I've gone. I've competed. I, I got I got a sense of what's going on there. And I would say that I would probably just develop what I've got uh, already rather than learning a, uh, something like the Dominic system or one of the other systems. But I would be more disciplined about it because when I went to compete, I was like switching systems in, in mid stride and that was not a good idea at all. Uh, and, and I made that mistake again when I was uh, in, a, in a public situation mistake is not the right word because everything worked out just fine. But uh, it is one of those things where uh, where the competitors have something to say about this, and I'll introduce you to some of those ideas coming up uh, that I don't really have to say. But if it's for everyday learning needs, then what you want to think about is what are you going to choose that's going to serve these everyday learning needs that is as quick as possible to learn, and then has certain aspects to it that enable you not only to to learn it quickly, but also have a progression towards more uses over time, more fluency, so to speak, with it over time. And the more that you have this fluency over time, the stronger and better and more fun that you have with it. And uh, this is really, really important. And that's why I would recommend ultimately a major based for most people. Uh, but if it's for everyday learning needs, then you think of that when you make your choice. And then if it's just for brain exercise, right? If you really just want the brain exercise, well, then you might want to have more than one system for one thing. And you might want to actually think about um, which one you think will give you more brain exercise. Because this is where something where an arbitrary assignment of the the two digits to something like 33, just being Charlie Chaplin for whatever reason, some arbitrary reason, that can give you more brain exercise than what I did, which is it's a mime because the major says that three is M. And since three is M and 33 has two M's, then the word mime comes up, right? And that's perhaps not more or less uh, uh, brain exercise, but it's certainly trying to save mental energy that way. And so that might not give you more brain exercise is what I'm trying to say. So when you're picking what you're going to do, all of the wide range, you go on Google, you look at all the different ways that different people do it, or you follow the links in the video description below. You just got to decide, like, what is it that you're really after here? And that will help you choose which one to do. So Grown Woman says, I'll be back in an hour if the stream is still on. I did use my PAO to remember a password at work. Awesome. Excellent. And, uh, Look forward to seeing you. I don't know if we'll be here or not, but uh, if we are, just get, say hello when you come back. And uh, if you think of any questions, let me know. But it sounds like you're doing great uh, all on your own and uh, beautiful about the password. All right. So if you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and where you're at with your PAO. And uh, let's rock and roll on to the next slide here. Let's talk about how to avoid learning the skills <laughs> that a PAO will create. Because there's a number of skills that you're going to create when you learn a PAO. First, you're going to learn some form of association, whether it's the major or the Dominic, you're going to learn a form of association that's going to strengthen your association abilities. Then you're going to learn how to focus and concentrate on juggling multiple pieces of information in your mind. And that whole thing about holding five to seven pieces of information in the mind at, time, at a time, you're going to extend that. You're going to make it very, very fluid if you actually do this properly and not cheat and actually give your brain the opportunity it deserves to do a bit of work. So if you want to avoid 
having those benefits, those outcomes, which is better concentration, better focus on top of a skill like being able to memorize numbers. If you want to avoid all that, then you can look up on the internet something like a Dominic system generator, right? Or you can look up a person action object app. These are things that people search for on the internet. And these are a path to learned helplessness and de-skilling yourself of the exact skill you're looking for. Because memory techniques are not, oh, I have to memorize something. Let me look at an app. No, it's someone threw a number at me, which you know sometimes happens uh, on these live streams. And then I memorize it. <laughs> There's no anything like that. I'm trained. I trained myself and I learned by studying many, many memory technique people how to just encode things that come very, very quickly. And so if you're going to skip the, uh, <laughs> the fundamentals, then you're not going to get the skills. And the, so going to a Dominic system generator that's going to pump up ideas for you is not going to get you the skill. Uh, going to a person action object app is not going to get you the skill. And going to the Bruno first number dictionary is definitely not going to get you the skill. And I know because I have the Bruno first number dictionary here. So uh, let me know in the chat if you want me to read some of his solutions for some of the numbers. And if I get enough interactivity from y'all, maybe I'll read some of this. But the point is, is that this is cool. It's interesting, but it's a path to learned helplessness. It's a path to de-skilling when you're trying to get a skill, right? And so how do you get that skill? Well, what you want to do is you want to create your own images. You want to practice them thoroughly and you want to evolve them over time. So we'll talk about each of these things, but let me say hello to Prim. Thanks for your question here in the chat. Thanks, Paul, for letting me know you're in Brisbane. I'm in Brisbane too. Away you go. There we are. So uh, have to remember that. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll meet up one of these days. Julio is here, says, uh, says, hello, you're in Mexico. Thanks for everything. Just testing my Spanish. Well, I don't know if my Spanish is, uh, <laughs> my pronunciation is that great, but I think I, uh, I think I got where you're at. I think I got what you're saying there. Thanks for that. All right. But yeah, always when you're chatting, let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, how you're thinking. And in this case, I don't see any chats all about wanting some examples from the Bruno first number dictionary. So, uh, we can skip that, but uh, if we see some requests, maybe we'll go into it. Um, Sean is in Alberta. All right. Well, I met a famous Albertan uh, last week named Jordan Peterson. That was fun. And my brother is like halftime in Alberta. He uh, goes back and forth. I've been there. I like Alberta. All right. So what does it mean to create your own images? Well, we're going to talk about it. And basically what it means is you take two digits and you either do the arbitrary Dominic uh, association or you learn more about the non-arbitrary approach to the Dominic. Uh, usually, the way, reason why I say that is usually when people tell me that they've learned the Dominic uh, is, is because they're, they're using a, an arbitrary version. Uh, they're just sort of hard memorizing whatever. And one of the reasons why that ends up happening to people is because He's a, of a particular age. His examples don't necessarily relate to every culture, to every demographic, to every psychographic, etc. And uh, the major helps with that. The, the major helps with that. So uh, it's really, really important to create your own images. And you need to create your own images anyway. If you really want to learn these skills, you've got to really, really actually uh, create your own images. You've got to learn how to create your own imagery. It's, there's just no getting around that. So, um, and then you want to practice them thoroughly. Now, the great thing is, is creating them is practice. So a lot of people, they get hung up on like questions. They get hung up on fear that it'll take too long. They get hung up on not knowing the outcome and et cetera, et cetera. You'll know the outcome by actually getting in and, and actually making it happen. Uh, and then you're going to evolve everything over time. And all my images are always subject to change. And I do change them. And uh, we're going to, uh, you know, see some examples of how I've changed them over time and why that, that happened and how it happened and why it's good practice. But let me uh, catch up with some of the chats here. Prem says he would like a example. Mathtrix says I'm from Nepal. How, have you known the country of Nepal? I know of the country of Nepal. I've never been there, but it looks uh, like a great place. My silly channel says I'm a bit late. No problem, silly channel. Uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, catch up with what you might need. Um, 
Prem says examples. Again, twice. Okay, well, uh, we need more than one person who wants these examples. Rishi is here from India. Great, great. And Paul says, cool. All right. So, um, yeah. We want to create our own images. We want to practice them thoroughly, and we want to evolve them over time. Really, really important. Okay. Um, we only got one guy. Boop, boop, doo, doo, doo. Well... Since we've got so many people here from India, you might be interested, if you don't already know it, in the Kata Payadi system. I don't know exactly how to pronounce that, but uh, before we get any further, let's look at some other examples. And I want you to all know that this kind of association between numbers and sounds is very, very old. So if you, like, we're talking about like around 300 uh, BCE, right? So if you ever want to like think, oh my goodness, this is such hard work and like talk yourself out of this, people have been doing this for a long time. Humans evolved with it. It's one of the reasons why the major probably evolved as it did. Nobody knows, but there's some really interesting things that we'll talk about later when I teach it to you uh, that are very, very powerful to realize. And, you know, I'm learning Sanskrit now and I see so many... Uh, interesting arguments that people make about the nature of the nature of of Sanskrit what it is, what it does in terms of being a paramshastram which means you know the highest science in Sanskrit and uh, it's really really interesting it's really interesting so the point is is that this idea of memorizing numbers by by making words or linking them to uh, consonants and sounds is very very old and it's been with humans for a long time so I'm going to skip from this ancient times to more recent times, uh, but there's certainly a lot in the 18th century, in the, in the 17th century, the 16th century, etc. that you can look up uh, in Tony Buzan's Mind Map Mastery. He has a nice little uh, uh, summary of some of the history in the Middle Ages and so forth that uh, you might want to check out. And uh, there's oodles. Actually, um, one of the best uh, rundowns is in the most recent Phil Chambers book. So you're going to want to check that out as well if you're interested in the history. But you should check out the, both of those books just because they're awesome. But uh, I'm going to skip to Alex Mullen. And he's the one that I really know the best from having spoken with him uh, on the interview, uh, the pod Magnetic Mary Method podcast. The link to that discussion is in the description below. And you're going to want to listen to it because he talks about you know, what he did to break so many speed records with, with cards or, or, you know, push the limits so far. And part of it is because he has an image, or at that time he had an image for every two cards together. So he really took it to a kind of exponential level. But, like, it sounds like from our discussion that his five is L, just like we'll talk about later, like so many other L's are. But you want to you want to check that out, and ultimately, it's really really interesting and impressive for people who learn this. But I, my point here is just to share with you that there's there's some competitive history here that uh, is is very good, and we're in the 21st century now. But I believe that Florian came up with this in the 20th century originally, the Millennium PAO. Also, there's a discussion with him that's linked to you in the. Uh, description below that you can go listen to as well as the page that this comes from so if you want to learn more about the millennium pao and some other approaches check that out and you know what he's talking about here is what he says this is an example for a grand memory system with a thousand people 100 actions and 1000 objects and it encodes eight digits in one pao image uh, so that's interesting memorizing eight digits at a time with one image so if you really want to accelerate beyond what I'm talking about, you might want to check out the Millennium PAO and learn from the source, and the links are for you in the description below. Um, let's see. Say hello to Nilesh. Thanks for saying hello. Good to see you. Now, next, I mean, there's so many that we can talk about, but another one we can talk about is the Ben system, and there's a number of components to it. I got the link for you down below. Let's try to move this a bit um so pretty much the uh, actual first consonant looks exactly like what i do and uh, then you've got vowel encoding which is pretty interesting 
and then second consonant. So I never went that that far myself, but uh, a lot of people have adopted it, and then some people moved away from it. Who knows? Maybe it'll come back. Um, there's lots and lots of different things. These are all in the competitive world, though. So my focus is really on just the uh, the major for everyday life, and so. Why did it skip that page? There it is. There it is. So if you wanted to create your first PAO list, I highly recommend that you start learning the major system or the major method. Now, I generally prefer to call it the major method because it's a method until that you create your own system. Then it's a system. It's, it's just that simple. Now, that sounds like semantics, but I think it's really, really important to point that out because so many people, they say... They want to um, learn a system or whatever, but you don't learn any system. You create the system based on the methods that you find from others. It's a fine distinction, but I think it's an important one because when people struggle to get a system working for them, well, you don't have to struggle uh, because you, you're trying to adopt another system, and unless you understand the, the method behind it, then you're not going to uh, have nearly as much uh, success because adoption and copying is not really how this works. It's learning the fundamentals and then basing your activities on a knowledge. It's action that actually creates the knowledge. So you might get uh, some understanding and some action steps, but it's actually going through the steps yourself that creates the knowledge. And then that leads to ultimately wisdom, right? And to skip any of that is really to allow the evil doctor forget to get hold of your heart and he's always waiting right? So it's really, really important um, to understand that you, you really have only methods and they're systems after you create the systems. And then the real next level stuff is to make sure that your systems are flexible, right? And flexibility comes from knowing the methodology behind the system in the first place. So all of which is to say, what you're seeing here is really the method that you can look at to try to create your own system. Let me check in with the chat. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Who would like to go through this uh, step by step? We did, we uh, really didn't have much interest here in the uh, number dictionary by Dr. Bruno first. But uh, if you are watching the replay later and you really want uh, some examples from that, let me know in the discussion. And uh, if you would like to go through this, let me know now so uh, I know what interest there is in discussing this letter by letter and looking at some of the finer details as I get a drink here and catch up with the chat. So Ajinkya asks, which according to you is the most efficient and easy system? Um, well, given what I just said about system, we want to consider the fact that we're not necessarily looking for easy, we're looking to get better and to be the best that we can relative to our goals. So at the beginning of this session, I talked about knowing what it is that you want. Do you want to compete or do you want everyday skills or do you want brain exercise? If you want brain exercise, then the ne plus ultra is to, uh, to basically um, have both, like do both just for the brain exercise benefits of it. But if you just want everyday skills the fastest and with the least amount of of you know hassle then i would suggest you just learn the major system and or better said the major method that you turn into the major system that you use for numbers so uh, let me know if you have any more questions around that only sean would like to go through this okay uh let me know if you are interested in going through this and uh, uh or we'll go straight into some examples um Mr. Silly, my Silly Channel says, are you currently engaged in any research work? Just curious. Now, Mr. Silly Channel, are you asking if I'm into um, uh, research in specifically in memory or general memory uh, or general research? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, but in terms of my own research, yes, I'm doing research into long-form verbatim memorization. So recently I did a demonstration of 32 verses from Sanskrit uh, in the Ribhu Gita that I memorized. And that was uh, a lot of fun. Um, and so now I'm working with the Bhagavad Gita and it is uh, really, really rewarding. And it's interesting because it's, it's quite a, quite a challenge 
And one of the things that I'm doing to accelerate the challenge is using bigger memory palaces than I've ever used before. So that's just applied research. In terms of memory research, well, I'm always researching memory. And uh, I went and, you know, saw and spoke with Jordan Peterson here. I got my VIP badge, and you may have seen the uh, picture of he, he and I there, um, and chatted with him about some of my ideas with memory and the research I'm doing. And a lot of what he talks about in Maps of Meaning relates to how memory techniques work and how they help people. It's not direct, it's indirect research, but the reality is, is that he talks so much about existing levels of competence in episodic memory and our ability to draw upon episodic memory in order to make the right decisions in life, to deal with uncertainty and fear. And so that's uh, something that has propelled me into more and more research about how that people can develop episodic memory faster, better, and how it relates to autobiographical memory, how it relates to figural memory, how it relates to um, procedural memory and to semantic memory and all these levels of memory and like not just that it relates to them but how that there are both actual distinctions and then where they're meshed together and so this is a really really interesting research it's not easy to you know necessarily say hey this is exactly uh, amazing for everybody to listen to when they just want to learn how to remember more um, <laughs> but uh I think it's a key to getting to next level training for people, more exercises. And so I'm very, very interested in it. And then I'm interested in finding out who in the audience is interested in memory science. Um, and if they are, you know, what can we talk about? And without, you know, uh, alienating others, but yeah, I think that the next frontier of memory training is very clear. Jordan Peterson gave me some ideas that are incredible and they're, they're pretty quote unquote next level. And I think the, the last thing to say in answer to your question is that I'm going to possibly bootstrap together a magnetic memory method app that is very, very different than anything that you've seen although there are some things that are getting closer, but I think that they're all just off on the wrong track. And I think that I have a concept for what is on the right track, but the test will be, will people actually want it? And will they use it if that it's not, um, if it's not exactly, you know, these wild goose chase fun and games of the apps that aren't creating the results that they promise. Cause I want something that creates the results that, that it actually can. And I think it can, but it'll require testing and it may be a 10 year project. I don't know, but I'm speaking with a couple of app developers now getting some quotes, trying to figure out, okay, like I know that that's what the final goal will, will create cost to create, but like, how can we get it so that it's just a working thing that a hundred people or so can download, help me test, and then see if it actually works, see if they're actually gonna use it. I have ideas about how to do that. I've done certain things like that before, but it's like applied research and it requires some R&D and uh, gotta do it right. Cause there's no point in doing anything that even if it works, people aren't gonna use. And there's no point in doing anything with an app that uh, I know won't work because there's no evidence that any of the others work, uh, even though they're very, very successful in their marketing. Uh, and, you know, basically duping people into goofing around and skilling themselves in areas that don't need skilling. You could get the same benefits from Mario, you know, so it's like, why not just play Super Mario? It's more interesting and fun um, than uh, some of those goofy uh, things that are essentially telling you lies. Um, so anyway, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? And uh, I, I, I always keep that kind of stuff in mind because nothing is to be gained by adding another app that just doesn't do anything. So that's my answer, Mr. Silly channel to your question about research. And, you know, I'm always doing research of different kinds, um, both in my own experiments with organic, unassisted memorization, doing great. Uh, I wonder if there's a Guinness World Record to break of the, the, the you know, the dude who's memorized the most Sanskrit. Pretty sure that... Uh, <laughs> 
there are some other dudes that have memorized way more than I have, but it might be a fun thing to go for. But I don't care about the laurels. I don't care about prizes. I don't care about awards. I care about just having fun, loving the contents of my mind, helping others love the contents of their mind, and uh, maybe doing something cool with an app and uh, really, really making it, uh, making it uh, work uh, for the world. So, uh, Nilesh says, how is it possible? I only got two yeses to go through this major method. Is that really? Can that be? We need more. <laughs> um, let's see. So, Nilesh says, how is it possible to memorize 30 objects in one minute? 30 or 50 objects. All right. Great question, Nilesh. It's very possible. Uh... You could do it with a memory palace and association. You can do it without a memory palace and association with some other form of linking. I think you probably do it sooner and faster with a memory palace, but try both ways. And, uh, you know, you might want to think about having three memory palaces or five memory palaces of 10 stations each, or maybe one memory palace with 50 magnetic stations. It's up to you. You've just got to dive in and figure it out. And basically how it works is you have a memory palace, you have an object, you encode the object, and uh, you're going to weave it into space with your memory palace. Um, like the last live stream we did, Fergus Craik uh, was over here, and uh, Robert Lockhart was over here. And so I just made some images for that. Basically, I remember what the images were. And uh, I'm pretty sure the 1972 was right here for the level uh, levels of processing effect. You, you can you can test my memory by go watching the previous live stream if you like. But um, that's how you do it. Now they're not objects, they're names. But I turned them into objects by associating them with objects. So Fergus Craig, if I remember, it was Fergus Ontario, my aunt actually, or sorry, my aunt's mom who actually lived in Fergus, I believe. And uh, then the Kraken. I was thinking about H.P. Lovecraft stories. So. Even people I've never seen, I've never seen a picture of them or anything like that, I turn them into objects, and that helps me get back to their names. And that's how you, you would do it. So it's not really that you're memorizing objects. You're memorizing associations, and those associations help you trigger what it is that you memorized. So that, that's maybe a useful distinction to keep in memory, is that you're not memorizing the target information. You're memorizing the association, and you're playing Sherlock Holmes in your head to go back through to the thing. And that's what this major method is all about. So um, Elisa says, yes, please kindly go through it. All right, I'm going to go through a couple more questions. Let me know if you really want me to go through it. And uh, let's see if we can get a couple more people opening up the cells of their brain by taking a bit of action, noting that if you really want to learn, number one best way to learn is like open up the floodgates of your brain, tapity tapity tap, tapity tapity type, get involved, get action. It's 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 a theory of investment. The more you invest taking action, the more likely you're to take the next action, and then the more likely you're going to take the next action, and then the more likely you're actually going to experience change in your life instead of just being the same person you always were, sitting in the back of the room, achieving nothing, doing nothing, feeling nothing. So uh, let me know if you really want to go through this. And uh, I'm going to get some water, and then I'm going to uh, go through some of these questions. And the next question is, how to earn money with memory, says Nilesh. Wow! Now there's a question I can get behind. I like that. That is, that's a beautiful question, Nilesh. And you know what? I want to pay you a compliment right now because you're thinking big and there's actually a whole live stream we got to do just about that. But while we're waiting to see if uh, we've got some equally ambitious people who would love to go through this uh, major system here, major method, um, and thanks to those who have been active so far, uh, will uh, will honor you, believe me. Um, but uh, I just want to pay this huge compliment to you, Nilesh, because that's the best question you could ask, right? And why? Well, it's because one of the things that memory training will do for you is it'll make you a more effective person and it'll help you achieve what it is that you want in life. Get better grades on the exams. Be a better performer at your work so that it's undeniable that when you get to the exam, you know, you're going to pass. When you get to the job interview, you're going to get the job. And one of the things that's really, really important here, Nilesh, is that when you can remember names, your EQ goes up. Because a lot of people, they worry about their IQ. 
But the reality is that you're going to want to increase your EQ because no one cares how smart you are. They care about how that you can emotionally connect and they're much more persuaded by your ability to emotionally connect and then your IQ comes second, then your intelligence comes second. And if you don't have those two things in balance, then you're in trouble. So that's that's a big uh, bird's eye view of what you would do. But then, you know, the other thing is, is you want to spend some time thinking about your vision for your life, thinking about your existing competence, your existing passion, what it is that you really want to do, what you would do even if you didn't make any money at it, and what you would show up to consistently, and then think about, you know, how will I do those things? What steps could I take in order to start moving towards that? And then if you think, well, I need a degree in... Uh, biochemistry or I need a degree in neurochemistry or I need a degree in this that the other thing then we're going to uh, we're going to have the issue of well do we have the memory that's going to support that learning that knowledge do we have the ability to learn quickly enough and thoroughly enough to actually get the A plus in the exam that's how memory is going to help you then when you get to the job you know you're going to have the opportunity to present what you remembered about the company. Go through a company website, brrr, memorize all the stuff there. Go through uh, you know, the goals of the company, memorize it. Go through the company's manifesto or its creed or its guiding principles, memorize them. Demonstrate sitting in real time what you've understood about that company and say that you understand it, you deeply connect with it, that you have it in your memory already. Like, that's a, a way to make more money, uh, for sure. Then if you're, a, you know, an entrepreneur or whatever, like memorizing names, memorizing stats, figures, uh, facts, th being able to just rapidly remember things that are being said in meetings and hold on to them and repeat them. It's just it's anything that you can do to establish your competence and really, really deliver what you know in ways that connect with people, both their logical side and their emotional side, that's, that's the path. So again, I want to pay you the huge compliment of even asking that question. It's the question really to ask, especially if you're a good, virtuous, honest person, which I assume you are, and your heart is in legitimately improving both the immediate world around you and the entire world via the, uh, you know, the butterfly effect that happens when you start to put good things out into the world because a lot of good things will happen that you can't even imagine or anticipate because you have that attitude. So um, again, where's my Spider-Man? With great power comes great responsibility. Keep that in mind at all times. All right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Jinka says, please consider keeping that app free or at least affordable to people outside the US, Canada. Please consider pricing your products for Indian Asian audience. Thanks for the suggestions. They're already priced for the Indian Asian audience. We have many, many people from India and Asia. Um, and so, Thanks for the suggestion, but I think it's uh, I think we're we're doing good for that. And uh, about free, Sam Harris has some compelling discussions recently about payment walls and all this. And uh, we just know that free doesn't really work. Free has switched on the hunter gatherer syndrome in humanity, and a lot of people are gobbling down stuff in which they have no investment. And so we really need to figure out how to actually get them to invest. And so I don't care if the people are in India or Asia or North America or wherever. There are people who just have funding issues all around the world. It doesn't have anything to do with India. It doesn't have anything to do with anywhere. I was in Canada. I needed money. I went out and mowed lawns. Okay. And uh, I mowed lawns until that I was well into my PhD. And part of it was because I didn't want to ever be lacking funds when a band came to town. I wanted to go and see them. Uh, and you know, there were times when I had more financial pressures than other times, but those pressures were very, very low because I had the wherewithal to see that there was snow on the ground. And I went and rang on doorbells and said, do you have anybody to shovel your snow? Do you have somebody to mow your lawn, etc." Um, so people have a scarcity mindset and they, they, uh, put themselves in, into poverty that they probably don't have. There is such a thing as saving up as well. So, um, 
And, and we just know there's no evidence that free is really working. Free has turned people into hoarders of information that they don't put into action. And so it actually is doing more harm than good in many, many contexts. There is an argument that it's done really a lot of good, but it depends on the nature of the information. It really, really does. Anyway, I don't want to turn this into a lecture on, on that, but if you, if you think that free is helping you, then why don't you have a Nobel Prize? Because there's all kinds of stuff on the internet for free that could get you a Nobel Prize, but it's not going to happen. It's never going to happen because there's got to be investment. And there's got to be a number of kinds of investment that not just include money, but also time and energy and focus and attention. And it is super, super important to understand that. And those who do understand it invest in themselves and they get done what needs to get done come hell or high water. All right. So travel videos. Hey, I think you're here in Australia, right? If not even in Brisbane, if memory serves, or we had a chat, something about Australia. Uh, last time I saw your, your name, I don't know if you're still here, but you say, I would like to try and get my children to learn Memory Palace using the houses they build in Minecraft. Great. So I have an interview with uh, someone named, if memory serves, Alicia Crosby. She's 10 years old at the time we did the interview. She must be 14 or 15 now. And uh, her dad, John, John, I think his name was, uh, he was on the call. If you'd like the link to that, let me know and I'll uh, get that for you. And I think that maybe I shared it with you before. Um, the problem is, is, you know, get my children to do stuff. Um, I, I'm not a parent, but I've seen that uh, <laughs> that can be a... Uh, a bit of a challenge and so I don't necessarily I don't necessarily uh, have advice on how to get children to do stuff but I think that one way that a lot of parents get their kids to do stuff is they learn these techniques themselves and they demonstrate them to the kids it becomes a magic maybe they put a little bit of scarcity psychology into things like um, would you like me to show you that? Oh, no, no, no. You're not ready. You're not ready. I'm not absolutely never going to show you that to you until that you're 21 because it's dangerous. You know, I don't know. I'm not a parent. So um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so you say great memory. Yes, I am in Brisbane. Well, that was a long time ago. And I think we only had that one uh, that one correspondence. And I did share it with you, but you have been slack. So um, listen to it with them together. I'm sure you can, quote unquote, get them to do it. But uh I think the real puzzle to solve here is how can we get you to do it so that they are so mystified by this magic power that you suddenly have that they will force it out of you and then they'll be thankful for life because you used reverse psychology to get it into them. So that's uh, my suggestion as a non-parent and possibly someone who never will be one. Um, but we'll see. It's early yet. <laughs> All right, so Math Tricks says to be a memory pastor, we should set the records or how? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the uh, question, but definitely set a goal for yourself and see if you can break your own goals. Let me know if you have more specific questions around that because I don't quite understand it. Nalesh says, I can do 60 digits in two minutes. How to do the same in one minute? Well, the first answer is practice. The second answer is practice. The third answer is practice. But along the way, refine how you are practicing. Get some books. Uh, look at the links below. Follow up on some of these things. Look at the different ways that people approach it. Put on a clock. Maybe um, be more active and shout about wanting some of these uh, examples from Bruno first to refine. I'm going to give some of my own examples and talk more about refining your images because if you refine your images, it'll probably be a lot faster. And uh, well, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and I'd really like to, um, to hear more about what you do, but I think that if you listen to all of the episodes that I have with memory competitors and one that I'm going to share in a minute here with a, with a non memory competitor competitor, if that makes sense. Um, let's, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll have some advice, but you got to follow up, right? This gets back to like free, you know, uh, the answer is, is there for you, but are you going to apply it? And one of the ways that you apply it is by investing a little bit because you'll have some skin in the game and then you'll actually follow through because you want an ROI on your investment. Uh, if you don't know the term ROI, it's return on investment. All right. So Will is here. Good to see you, Will, in Missouri. Always good to see your name and your very memorable 
um, image there. Jason says, I've used an app called 5D Planner made for designing houses and buildings to create 3D memory palaces, but I will add that I find using real life locations in real time to be the best. Thanks for that, Jason, and thanks for the um, qualification there. I find that too. I mean, I've done all kinds of wild experiments, and at the end of the day, real life is the real deal for the fastest results. And I would say there's even more distinction on that as well in terms of the, how the memory palace is created and the nature of the palace, which I mentioned earlier. I'm doing some stretching exercises now, and I'm pushing it, but it'd be a lot easier to to encode in, in the more traditional memory palaces that I know and love. All right. Travel Video says, yes, I need it too. My memory is terrible, terrible and it affects my works, makes my public speaking hard, and I lack confidence. Well, thanks for mentioning that. You know, we have a meetup group here in Brisbane, and last time we met, we talked about public speaking and giving presentations. So uh, join us. Look up on meetup.com, Magnetic Memory Method, and, you know, I'm probably going to do one in March here. Uh, come out, support, bring your kids. Um Bring yourself, uh, bring your friends. Uh, this is a public service I do for the local community. And yeah, last time we had, uh, let me see, we had Justin, Kimberly, um, Alan, and Lisa, and Shayla. And uh, yeah, that was it. But that was, we had a great meeting. And uh, I believe I got all those names correct. And sometimes people are there and they just uh, join us. All right. So, I uh, hope to see you there, travel videos. And uh, confidence is something that anybody can build and build very, very easily in ways that are fun. And really the trick is, are you invested? Do you do, is the pain really big enough? And if it isn't, then there are tricks for making it bigger in your mind so that you compel yourself to take action. Or maybe you need to not focus on the pain, you need to focus on the reward. And there are tricks that you can use, mental ninja, ninja wizardry, that will help you uh, magnetize the reward and draw yourself towards it with greater effect. Uh, and so um, that may be something for you. Um, let's see. Mr. Silly Channel says, artists can utilize their drawing skill for memory. What saved me in my fill exam was my drawings. Instead of making notes, I drew pictures, which I just had to look at once or twice before the exam. Awesome, awesome. So, I yeah, I talk about drawing pictures a lot, and it's very, very important. Uh, great suggestion for everybody. Thank you for that. Uh, Nilesh says, you are a very nice person. Thanks, Nilesh. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for saying that. Paul says, is there any way you can increase the volume? Well, the volume is as loud as it goes, but... Thanks for mentioning that. Let me see if I can do something about that by moving the microphone closer and maybe changing it a little bit. Forgive any uh, noise that's going to come for those of you who don't have the volume all the way on, but I'm going to see about raising this microphone a little bit. Whoa, maybe not that high. And does that help? I don't know, but f people have... Um, a lot of different experiences with this microphone and some people say it's too loud and some people say it's too quiet but let me know if that's any better and uh, we'll carry on here Nilash says can you give your WhatsApp number WhatsApp number and uh, how to remain in touch with you so no I can't give that because I don't have WhatsApp and Lisa I'm glad you're still here loud and clear I will uh, be going through this in a second I Certainly had enough uh, yeses, so we'll do it. Uh, thanks for still being with us and letting me know that it's sounding okay for you. Uh, I might try a different microphone the next time because I have uh, one that might be better for live streaming. It would certainly save a lot of hassle uh, changing the microphone a lot around a lot. All right. So anyway, yeah, Nalesh, I don't have a WhatsApp. The only thing I have is a special app that uh, people use in China, and the only person I speak to on it is my father-in-law for my daily Chinese. And uh, wow, we have a lot of fun with that. But other than that, man, I barely use a phone. Um, I really uh, don't uh, don't uh, have that kind of stuff in my life, interruptions and whatnot. But if you want to remain in touch, get subscribed to this channel. If you're with us now and you're not subscribed, get subscribed. Hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. 
and uh, I really, really want to uh, to keep in touch by being in my take my free course at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash yt and start getting the emails. People who are not on my uh, email list, they miss so much. They miss so many special things, so many opportunities. There's a workshop coming up that, you know, I don't think I'm even going to mention on YouTube because it's really just for people who have taken my free course and are on my email list. So uh, that's how to get in touch, Nalesh. And um, I'll look forward to hearing from you when you've taken the free course. Nalesh says, you said to practice, practice, practice. What will happen with that? Well, that's an interesting question. Nobody knows what will happen when you practice, practice, practice. A lot of people have the fear of the unknown. So I recommend that you give up the fear and do it anyway. That's what, uh, that's what athletes do. That's what the star top performers in every field do. They feel the fear and they do it anyway. And they, give, they get rid of the need for uncertainty. They absolutely get rid of the need to know what's going to happen before it happens. And they just dive in and they get it done and they persist until they reach their goal. And I know that it can be hard for people to do that. And that's why I'm doing so much research in episodic memory and the things that Jordan Peterson says in Maps of Meaning and thinking about how an app can help people in this regard. Um, and I think I know how to do it. I just don't know that, uh, that the funding will be there. Uh, but oddly enough, the bank called me and asked me today if I wanted to take out a loan. <laughs> and I was like, you know, this app uh, that I was talking with some developers about does it's in loan territory. All right. Um, in terms of what it would cost to do it right. But again, I'm looking for the, um, for the bootstrapped version just to test and I'll, I'll find the right people. These things just take time sometimes. All right. So I'm going to get, uh, to some of these chats that are, uh, still coming in and, uh, then let's carry, let's carry on and let's learn the major and talk about some of the things that will help you remember it, actually, because it's pretty clear, right? You're taking a number and you're associating it with a consonant. Now, notice this consonant focus here. Why focus on a consonant? The answer is very, very simple. You will have a hard time making enough words and decent words and good words if you don't um, have these as consonants. Now, obviously the Ben system has some coding for vowels. You can go and do that, but I, I don't really see how that would be a useful investment for everyday use. And I'll give you some examples of how this plays out in everyday use and why you wouldn't need to go there. Although you can, and it's great brain exercise and, and why not? Um, but notice the emphasis on consonants. This is because when you have consonants, you're going to be able to make words easier and you're just going to pick the vowels that help you make words. We'll get into some examples. Zero, soft C, S, or Z. Why is it soft C, S, or Z? I don't know, and I don't think anybody does, but notice something. C, S, Z, or even Z. Do you notice something about this? It's all produced in the exact same part of the mouth. C, S, Z or Z, all coming from the same part of the mouth. Isn't that interesting? I think that probably people thought about this when they uh, were designing this system and they, they, they tried to get all of the related points in which sounds are produced by the mouth and put them with some numbers. So there may even be a, con a, a reason why zero is with the Z because, you know, it makes sense, right? How are you going to remember this? Well, that's one way, just to notice that Z and zero go together, right? That's an implicit association. But you can also see a giant snake eating its own tail, and it's snoring while it's choking itself to death, right? So um, Z and the snake is an S, right? And then you could even see Cookie Monster reaching through to dip his cookie in some milk because... Milk makes cookies soft. Soft cookie, soft Z, get it? Or sorry, soft Z, <laughs> get it? So that's one way to get all those into one image, right? What, 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 how would you memorize this image? Where would you revisit in your mind that this image is, uh, you know, a snake 
eating its own tail and zing away? Well, how about in the corner of a memory palace? How about in a memory palace? Somewhere in a memory palace. How about, since that we have a very, very solid number of things to memorize here, how about we put them in a memory palace that has just as many spots as we need? And then the first station has this image. One, D or T, right? Notice, D, T, produced in the exact same, well, almost exact same part of the mouth. Isn't that fascinating? One, D or T. Now, notice that the D and the T both have a downstroke. How many downstrokes? One each. So that's a way of memorizing that. Um, you could also think about how T is like a cross. Only Jesus was, you know, well, a lot of people were sacrificed on a cross, but he's the only one who was said to come back from the dead, uh, except for uh, some other guys. But anyway, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot to this. Um, so you can come up with lots of things, but the most obvious one is that each of those letters has a downstroke, but also you could do something like with the one uh, is the only one who was on a cross who came back from the dead. Two is N. So two has two downstrokes, but also Noah took the animals on the ark in pairs. You know, I used to play a funny trick on my students at university, and I used to say, how many pairs of animals did Moses take on the ark? And they'd be like, oh, he took them in pairs or whatever. I was like, really? <laughs> and then I'd point out, well, no, Moses didn't take, he didn't have anything to do with the ark. And they'd go, uh. But it's a fun joke, and I taught it to them precisely to show how little attention they're paying most of the time. And I said, uh, if you pay more attention, then you're going to have better uh, better results in this course. And, you know, that's a fun joke uh, that you can play. But it makes a point of how we have selective attention and we sometimes fill in the blanks and the gaps and, and uh, we do it in a way that is negative. But it also shows us the miracle of the mind and how it fills in the gaps. So uh, think about that. Now, speaking of Moses, three for Moses. Imagine that burning bush had three sticks because Moses... I believe, was the guy who saw the burning bush, right? And uh, in the Exodus, the God there, he actually says in Hebrew, Abba, um, which is a very, very short word for a very long sentence, which means I am becoming that which I will become. Um, really nice, really nice, uh, philosophically speaking. Now, uh, M is also a mustache. Look, I've got a mustache. It doesn't exactly look like a three, but it doesn't not look like a three. Uh, it's also McDonald's has a giant M Lots of options. Four is R. Well, it's kind of like a R backwards, right? Um, if you think of um, uh, a RAR file, right? That has four squares, uh, or it has four corners, a RAR file, more or less. Um, uh, that icon, if you remember it. I don't know if computers have RAR files anymore, but anyway, that's, that's something you could think of. Five is L. Five fingers. Oh, I guess I better do it that way. L. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, six as ch, j, soft g, or sh. Um, that might be a little bit more hard, but imagine the Joker, for example, with a six shooter. Um, maybe I had a friend named Charles, and uh, uh, I just saw him playing the bass from Nikki Six in uh, Motley Crue, the band there, um, and so on. So, or maybe Curious George for the soft g. Um, Maybe he's doing something that starts with S-H on the man. Uh, you know, like there's lots and lots of uh, things you can come up with there. Seven is a hard G or a K. Uh, I never use the hard G, but K is pretty simple for seven. I mean, it almost looks like uh, there's a seven in there. A seven that's all drunk and backwards and leaning on a stick. Um, eight for F or V. Uh, so, you know... To me, that one, I never even, I never memorized the last two with any special image because it somehow just made sense, right? Um, but uh, let's think what you could do. Um, so V8, that was a, a drink. Maybe it still is a drink. It, when I was a kid in Canada, my dad always used to drink V8, vegetable juice. And nine as a B or P. Well, nine looks like P and it looks like a B upside down. So pretty easy. That's probably why I never had to, um, to do anything. So that's my run through. How are you going to practice it? Well, you're going to, the best way, the fastest way, the easiest way is to make a memory palace, stick them all there. If you have, um, you know, um, nine as a, as a golf club or something like that, then you're going to think, what letter does a golf club look like? Well, it looks like a B or a P. And that's in the end of your memory palace journey. 
you're done. And then you go to eight and you're like, oh yeah, that can of V8. I think that's what that juice was called. Um, or maybe there's some other V8 you can come up with. Like, isn't V8 also the name of an engine or something like this? Uh, anyway, so use a memory palace. This, this is two to five minutes of memorization work. And then you're going to practice it by going through the memory palace in the different patterns that I teach in the master class. And but a bang, but a boom, it's done. It's done. Then you have the next steps. How are you going to turn all this into a 00 to 99 PAO? Well, this is where the fun happens, right? So you can either get a number dictionary, which not enough people really wanted to dive into, so we won't, but um, uh, you can just hard code, you know, and this is where you'll get the real brain exercise. So you get out your memory journal, you have a page, you put zero, zero, and then you think you can have this in front of you, or you can just have memorized it, and you can think, Dr. Zeus, that'll work for zero, zero, or Thomas Zaz, that'll work for zero, zero, or maybe something else, right? Then you look at zero, one, and you go, Oh, I could make the word sad out of that. That's what I've done myself, um, which is actually the tragedy mask. And here's the thing. Sad is a concept. So how are you going to make something like sad an image? Something that's, mm, well, you push it. And I push it to tragedy mask. And then I think, well, that's still a bit vague. Let me, um, by the way, keep your questions and your comments coming. I'll catch up to them after we go through this. Sad tragedy mask. It's a bit vague. So then I think, who have I seen with a sad tragedy mask on their face? <gasps> William Shatner. He was in a version of Oedipus Rex. It could also be Phantom of the Opera. I don't know, something, right? It's not really a tragedy mask, but it's tragic. And it's a mask, so you could do that. Um, zero two, the sun. I'm not going to go through all of my zero zero to 99, but uh, zero two is the sun. Kind of vague, though, right? I mean, there is a real sun up in the sky. Mmm, beautiful sun. I like you. Uh, but... You also have um, uh, movies like Sunshine. Danny Boyle, I believe, was the director. So uh, there you go. Uh, and 03, 04, all the way up to 99. Beautiful. Do you have to do it in one day? No. Work at it. Get it done. And then I, I said I would talk about evolving them over time. Well, for the longest time, 84, I had just fire, right? Can you see on this chart here why that 84 would be fire? Well, F is an eight and r is a four right so fire but then i realized this is too vague uh and so but i realized it like a couple years later and so i upgraded it to a flamethrower but not just a vague flamethrower but a flamethrower in the hands of a character from missing in action part two remember that chuck norris movie man what a movie i think i probably wouldn't be able to watch it anymore but when i was a kid i watched that thing it must have been 50 times probably not 50 times but it certainly feels like that and uh I remember that flamethrower scene like it was yesterday. So there you go. Um, but yeah, make it specific and always think, how could this be more specific? And over time, I still to this day, every once in a while, I'm like, man, that's way better for that image. And then I make it way better. Um, so uh, an example just came up the other day. So 51, I've had Alan Ladd for the longest time. And then... Alita Battle Angel came out. Now, I didn't instantly think, oh, maybe I'll change Alan Ladd for Alita Battle Angel, but one of the members in the Magnetic Memory Method mastermind named Lee, he said, and I really like Lee, he's, he's a go-getter and really has great ideas. He, um, he said Alita uh, is now going to be his, and I was just like, damn, why didn't I think of that, right? And then I think, well, now I do. And then the reality is, is you don't have to give up your original 51 or your original whatever it is. You can have both. And in many cases, I do have more than one piece of information or one magnetic image for numbers. So um, lots and lots of uh, lots of options, lots of options. All right. So we got a lot of comments and questions coming in here. Let's dive into them. Let me know if you have questions about the major and building it and developing it into a 99, 00 to 99 PAO. I got a couple more examples coming up uh, showing you it in practical everyday use. But... Um, that's coming up. Let me know if you're here, new, just joining the stream. Hit the thumbs up. Say hello in the chat. Let me know um, what you're doing, where you are, what you're thinking. And if you have any questions, we'll go through some questions. We've got some more suggestions and ideas for your first PAO list. Uh, Paul is saying, is the Bruno First Dictionary a helpful book? It's just a book that came in the box with You Can Remember. I got another of his other books here. Um, this is the home study course in memory and concentration. 
I'm going to do a big mega review of all the Bruno First material that I was able to find. And uh, the number dictionary, I would say, is good if you want to de-skill yourself. Do what I just said if you want to skill yourself and have a skill for life. Um, so I've just looked through this. And, you know, it's interesting that so few people actually said they wanted to dive into some of the examples from this. That's probably a good thing. I shouldn't complain about it because the reality is, is the best way to get the skill is to figure this out for yourself. Um, there's other problems with it that uh, I'll talk about in my full review coming. But uh, thanks for that question. And we're going to go into the questions in uh, um, chronological order here. If you have questions, keep them coming, and I will uh, catch up with you. Don't feel like uh, you're being ignored, because I will go through. And if for some reason my um, computer eyes woo, uh, in these lights miss your chat, we'll pop it in again. That's uh, no problem. But don't feel ignored, because I'm, I'm not ignoring you. Um, so ho hopefully for Paul, that volume issue is fixed um, Jason says Nilesh seems like more practice with the major system would help create words and images associated with the numbers more quickly indeed indeed Nilesh says he's using a different system well <laughs> practice a different system and maybe add another one Jason says, on the topic of practice, Anthony, have you heard about the term neuroplasticity and you feel like there's something to it or is it more of a fad gimmick? Oh no, neuroplasticity is real um, for sure. And we know this because of brain scams. Scams, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> maybe brain scan, maybe brain scamming is a, brain scanning is a scam. No, that doesn't work. Well, anyway, that's an interesting, you know what that's called? It's called slip of the tongue, but I think the term, the science term is parapraxis. Um, so I always like to pay attention to uh, slips of the tongue. I think there are some slips of the tongue that are legitimate, just accidents because uh, you're not drinking enough water. Uh, but that is an interesting one. <laughs> anyway, the point is, is that there are really, really interesting brain scans that show neuroplasticity. And one of the things that's coming in my next book which is now with the editor. Just heard from him today. We're going to have a, and a sample for people uh, as soon as he can get it to me. But uh, he had some interesting recommendations of what that sample should be. But yeah, the next book is coming soon. And one of the arguments that I make in that is that the neuroplasticity that comes from meditation is very similar to the neuropl uh, neuroplastic changes that come from memory techniques, especially if you use your memory techniques in meditation, which is what that book is going to teach you how to do. And... I know that when I tell people to memorize cards, they sometimes have a hard time seeing how that that could possibly help them. So we're going to go really into the deep end and I'm going to tell them to memorize Sanskrit and show them how to do it. Um, but it's actually a, a, an easier way to explain how that can help them. Um, because the Sanskrit at least has meaning, uh, whereas cards do not. Anyway, uh, yeah, I look, I'm not a believer in neuroplasticity. I'm a person who has scrubbed belief from my life in so far as that is possible and just followed the evidence. And there's a number of levels of evidence, but some very, very good scientists simply can't be making up these stories. Um, and it's very unlikely that these brain scans are, are, are a scam or fantasy or anything like that. Uh, and there's a number of ways to cross index and come to your own conclusions as a person, whether you're a scientist or not, who is able to, um, who is able to uh, come to your own conclusions at the end of the day and test assumptions for yourself. And that's the origin of the new book that's coming out as soon as we can get it out, um, is that I didn't really believe some of the claims of how people get to enlightenment. And I think of myself as a true uh, skeptic and scientist. I mean, I have a PhD that, you know, I got it because I was able to demonstrate my my scientific abilities. Uh, and I just thought, you know what? I have to test this. I have to see what the heck they're talking about. And lo and behold, it it really did even better than what they ever claimed. And now I understand a lot about about it from lived experience. And I'm hoping to do some ways from a scientific skeptical perspective to explain to people why some of this crazy stuff they talk about in the religious world and in the 
the uh, meditation world not only works, but makes sense to do, even if you don't believe in it, because you don't need to believe in it. The evidence will come or it won't come. And it's very, very profound. And a lot has really happened to me that is just incredible. And I feel really called to bring down the, 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 the so-called atheist fist on this, because if you follow the current dialogue and so forth, like Eric Weinstein has really tackled Richard Dawkins recently and said, you can't go on the, so hard on the religious people. It doesn't make evolutionary sense. And I think what, uh, or sorry, I'm thinking about Brett Weinstein. Apologies to Eric, but I think Eric probably says similar things. Um, but I really resonated with that because I did these experiments in memorizing so much religious stuff, so much. And it really did change my, it changed exactly how I feel as a person. And uh, same thing with mem numbers. Like once you get your PAO going, um, and I'm going to share with you some powerful exercises to practice them coming up soon. But uh, man, you'll feel the difference. You really will feel sharper. And it's, it's, it's got to be because of neurochemical changes to the brain. So thanks for that question. Uh, and, you know, if you want to look, if you, if you haven't read Waking Up by Sam Harris, it is a book about memory in many, many ways. And I don't think he really thinks of it that way. But I do. When I read it the second time, I just thought, this is a book about memory. It's really, it really is. Um, so, and it's a science-based book on the science of, of secular spiritual meditation practices and why we should be doing them in order to experience deeper levels of fulfillment and calm and focus in life that, quite frankly, a lot of religious people have. And we can do it without taking on all that all that woo-woo. And we don't need the belief element. We don't need to believe in things. We don't need faith because the the real thing is to be a scientist. Nietzsche talked about this in um, in the gay science, which is a term that, you know, it, it really, the German translation is better, like the science of joy or uh, something like that. But um, uh, in any case, science is beautiful and science will win the war, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but I think that we can find ways to do it with secular spirituality well intact that will improve the entire world. And so the Indian traditions that I've been studying at Vaita Vedanta in particular, they're very scientific. And in fact, paro, uh, Param Shastram means ultimate science. And it's one of the things that I memorized. And I was just like, this is the ultimate science for sure. They're right. And they can say that because they're teaching you to be scientific through meditation about the nature of your experience. It's beautiful, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Can't say enough about it, so I wrote a whole book. Coming soon. All right, so I hope that answers your question, uh, Jason. Really appreciate it. Um, Avash is here from Nepal. Great to see you. Avash, thanks for saying hello. Jason says, yes, there are specific terms for phonetic sounds related that way. For example, B and P are called plosives. F and V are fricatives. D and T are dentals. Plosive as in explosion. Dental as in formed in the teeth. And nasals are so-called because of their how their sound passes through the nose. Excellent. Thanks for that, Jason. I want to... Uh, uh, I'm going to ask your permission, but I'm going to do it first and get your permission later. But I'd like to um, copy what you just said so I can memorize it later and then possibly add it into my book. And... Uh, quote you on that as being the contributor put you in the thank you and all that jazz uh, so let me know if that's cool with you if you're still with us and uh, there we go i got that memorize that later and pop it into the book that'd be cool um nilesh asks what should be the idle time for memory course for teaching the student i don't know what you mean nilesh but Feel free to refine that question and pop it in. What should be the idle time for memory course for teaching to student? Uh, give it another go and uh, see if there's another way to ask the question. What should be the idle? Uh, I mean, I can guess that maybe you're saying, uh, how should people practice and then take a rest? I'd say that most people I, I've uh, known, they're really good with just five or five or six minutes at a time, take a break and come back at it. I spend, you know, maybe an hour or two a day on my own projects. Um, but I am doing long form memorization. And so Paul says six looks like a soft G that got molded, capital G. 
Yeah, that's a that, that's a good uh, good one. Uh, Avash says, "How would you memorize? How would you remember this? Any man who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving kiss the attention that it deserves. How would you remember that in a memory palace? Well, Avash, I wouldn't, but <laughs> that's not the issue here. Um, so what you're going to do, right, is you're going to look at your existing level of skill. You're going to make sure you have enough memory palaces. You know what you're doing and how to do it. And uh, you're going to start with any man, right? So any man, uh, you're, you you got to think where you're at with your skill. If I had to do this, I'd probably see my friend Anne, and uh, she'd be kneeing a man, perhaps in a place that that man would not want to be kneed. So now it's like Anne plus knee, a man. Now man is not very specific, but Johnny Cash was the man in black, so we'll use him. And now we have any man. And... Uh, maybe the next memory palace station he's going to be driving right and uh there'll be a crash test dummy there with him to help remember the safety part right and then uh, he'll be kissing the crash test dummy who will be a really sexy dummy and uh and so on so i would just go like that that's how you do it the important thing is that you follow up the encoding with recall rehearsal so it gets into long-term memory and that's why you encode in a memory palace to make recall rehearsals so much faster and easier and more effective. Nalesh says, what is easy memorize deck of card or memorizing numbers? Well, I would suggest that you memorize a deck of cards using numbers. So if you can memorize numbers, then you can memorize a deck of cards. And Nalesh asks, when is your next live YouTube video? I don't know. And uh, if you're subscribed to this channel and you hit the bell icon, you'll get notified. If you're joining us now, Hit the thumbs up, get subscribed if you're not already, and hit the bell icon. And if you are subscribed and you haven't hit the bell icon, make sure it's on. YouTube changes stuff all the time. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but uh, these are not announced. If you want announced times, then I suggest you join the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass and select the Mastermind option so you can be part of the dojo, the Memory Dojo. And then there are scheduled sessions. Uh, that's how that works. Uh, thanks for the question, though. And I will be coming randomly when I feel like it uh, in the future. Nilesh says, or sorry, Ajinka says, thanks, man, for your time and this valuable information. God bless you. Right back at you, my friend. Uh, Nilesh says, thanks for your time and info. So kind you are. God bless you. Well, thanks for all the blessings. Uh, right back at you. Om Tat Sat. Tat Vam Asi. Um, <laughs> those are not chats. Just uh, giving you a blessing back. Hmm. Paul says to make my major method method more or my major system more specific, I'm adding people to the objects, but the people often don't have to have much to do with the objects since both are just based on the major letters. Is this okay? Yeah, Paul. Well, that's when I evolve my stuff. I always think about how can I get rid of the action in the object so that the person is the action in the object. That's the flamethrower example. So um, we need to add this to the flamethrower example. Uh, this. Uh, idea is that a man with a flamethrower is the action of the object he's holding and since he's really just wow that's kind of cool um <laughs> the uh the thing is, is he is the action because he's so fused to the object that he's holding uh another example 16 is it used to be dish but i turned it to dashel hammett and he's dashing dishes so now there is no real person action object. He's so fused with it that it's almost the same thing. Uh, so think of that in your practice. Uh, and then in any case, when questions answer with uh, end with, is this okay? Of course it is. Just try it. And if it doesn't work, come back to some of the suggestions and, uh, and uh, obviously take the course on numbers in the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass if that's what you need to come up to speed. Harvinder's here. Hello, Harvinder. Good to see you. Uh, Avash says, oh, this is another thing about, uh, kissing girls in courses and cars. Paul says, so for example, 21 is nut, but also Nikola Tesla, though they have, the two have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Uh, again, I would just like for me, nut is the word that I use, but I don't think of a nut. I think of Jack Nicholson going nuts he is already the action in the object because how does he go nuts? Axe. 
here's Johnny, right? Like he, he he's he's crazy. His craziness is the action because he is crazy, right? And it's just object built in because he's got that axe, right? Now, do I see the axe every time that I use it to encode? No, not necessarily, but I can if I need to. So now we've got another opportunity here to speak about the role of context when you're memorizing. So this is why I find the PAO often very, very useless the way it's taught with person, action, object being divided. What if you don't need any of those, right? Then, and almost always you'll need less than, than is given there. And then that trips people up. It could be a lot faster. Um, so think about that. Think how with every single one you can reduce it rather than have three things going on at the same time. Again, this is non-competitive. If you're a competitor, they have reasons why they do it that way. And they have reasons why that they don't sometimes. And and I've talked with a lot of them and, and they pick their battles too. They don't always use every single component. It's just figuring out how to do this in real time, real quick so that it works. And that comes from experience. Uh, Jason says, seems like Nikola Tesla would give you 275 uh, or 145. Uh, oh, 275.105. Yeah, um, it, it could, but this is the thing, right? Just because it could give you those numbers doesn't mean it has to. So um, I use a number of times things that would be three digits, but they're not. And I know that they're not because I'm the guy who encoded them. Uh, so, and, and this comes to the thing, like, are you doing a 00 to 99 or are you doing a 000 to 999? And I never finished uh, past uh the, the the 200s because it just obviously was no it was no no value right like <laughs> gone through lists and endless lists and so forth and i wasted time because dr bruno first here has a has a massive list all the way up to 1000 i didn't have to do any of that work but i'm glad i did because it taught me a lot and one of the things that it taught me is that there's no point in doing it there's no point in doing it like it's just not useful in everyday life for me and uh, i suspect for most people all right, so Paul is just using the initials. All right, you guys are having a chat with yourself. Let me know if there's questions about what you're uh, talking about, but great to see you collaborating. Um, let's see. So Nilesh is back on the earning money topic. I think we covered that in a lot of detail. So uh, we'll, we'll skip that. Paul says... I'm wondering if it's okay to be using the major for both instead of connecting it logically, such as Anthony's example for sad. Uh, the reason I decided to use the major for both is that if I could expand it to a full PAO by then using the same 100 people. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly the whole context of what you're referring to, but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, if you already have a hundred people, you could reform it in some sense by giving them these objects. But again, I would think that the real deal is to think about how you can fuse as many of them as possible so that they are the object. All right, let's see here. Uh, Jason says, yeah, okay, to what you were saying about copying, what I sound. Thanks, Jason. Awesome. Everybody give Jason a thumbs up. If you haven't hit the thumbs up already, give this next round to Jason. If you're just joining us, let me know in the chat where you are in the world, what you're doing. Pop in any questions that you uh, that you may have. And uh, let's rock on with some more questions here. Nilesh says, for teaching student in workshop, how many hours a teacher can teach like eight hours? I don't know, uh, Nilesh. I was always a university professor. I taught for like 90 minutes, two hours max. And... Uh, uh, teaching for eight hours, people who are teachers, I really honor them. They work really hard. Uh, Paul says, yeah, I can see how, you, okay, so you guys are chatting with yourselves. Great, great, great. Avash says, once you, once you have wrote in Hebrew that I used Memory Palace to remember, what does it mean, outso mayalim? That was the pronunciation. Um... Not sure what you're asking there, Avash, but go ahead and reframe your question if you like and type it in. Jason says, I can see it adding a person or section object, a uh, second object, just to clarify what the B sound wasn't used. Um, yeah, absolutely. Nilesh asks, what can you say about sex memory? Ooh, sex memory. Um, well, I don't know what you mean, but um, I can certainly say 
a lot about the fact that using sex in your magnetic images can be useful, but um, I rarely do. Uh, but I know other people do, and uh, I don't know what they do, and I don't want to know because uh, that's that's for them, and uh, hopefully they uh, stick with it. All right, so, um, but I am interested in sex and memory, especially thinking about gender, and I talked with uh, uh, Katie Kermode recently about her memory uh, competition experience and some of the things that she does, and I didn't think to ask her about gender and any thoughts that she has around it. But you know what? It doesn't really matter at the end of the day because humans are humans and their brains are awesome. And they say that some women uh, after pregnancy have some memory issues, but I'm not sure it has to do with pregnancy. It may have to do with any kind of painkillers that they have, plus the additional demands on their cognition that taking care of children would bring. So, um, I don't know, at the end of the day. Interesting issue, though and certainly something to look into. And if we can translate that into, into things that will improve our practice, we'll do it, we'll do it. Paul says, my general plan is to have a major for everyday use where a person and object are one thing, but more fun competitive settings. I plan to have a PAO which holds six digits at a time. Great, great, great. Yeah, um, that's certainly the uh, the thing when I competed with uh, Dave Farrow, he said he was only at five digits per 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 image or station, um, and that was back in 2015. So I don't know where he is now, but six is certainly doable. I can see doing it. Uh, that's just not what I'm going to do. But yeah, um, have fun with that, Paul. I'm sure it's going to be a great adventure. Jason says, Anthony, are you saying you use the same permanent set of images for every list you create? In numbers, yeah, it's always the same. And if so, you don't run into ghosting issues. No, no. Well, first of all, ghosting is just not anything that is an issue. It's not. People who make it an issue, they're they've got they've got other problems. Um, and uh, uh, if you listen to the episode that I have with Idris Ogai, we talk about it. Uh, we also talk about. Um, related things like cleaning memory palaces. And I have a post on the website called The Ultimate Guide to Overcoming the Ugly Sister Effect. And basically, this is a huge, huge issue that so many people make a big deal out of when it shouldn't be. There's no reason for ghosting to happen. And I can tell you, I sit and I memorize cards day after day and there's no issue. Even if I do remember what was there yesterday, it's not an issue. And Brad Zupp and I, we recorded a, 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 a private training that is going into the masterclass in the near future. And we, we just talk about that issue actually. And um, the compounding is the answer basically. So ghosting is, ghosting is a problem that people accept. And it's not a, it's a problem because they accept it into their lives. But man, it's not a problem. It is an absolute miracle <laughs> that it happens <laughs> and people should embrace it and use it as a tool. All right. Acro is here. Good to see you, my friend. It's been a while. Excellent, excellent. Um, wonderful, wonderful. I, I never I, I never really asked, is it like Acro is in Acro Yoga? Uh, that would be interesting to know. Um, Paul says, it's sorry to articulate what I'm trying to do, but I think I have my answer anyway. LOL. Yeah, I did. Th these, this is a complicated topic to describe because of the uh, amount of information that we're talking about in the brain. But... Um, uh, and how we're using our brain, like it doesn't translate into words very well. And that's why people who don't take action and get caught up in questions and uh, nothing wrong with having questions, but action is the answer. You'll learn by doing. Um, so, uh, oh, Acro, by the way, I want to ask, I want to see if I can remember your name, but I, I want your permission to uh, actually use your name and see if I remembered it. Uh, that'd be a fun little test. Um, so let me know if that's cool with your first name. As I only memorize the first name anyway, I believe, if I got it right. But I just want to see, and then you can uh, let me know. I'm kind of curious. I like these little tests once in a while. But if you prefer to be anonymous. Okay, so you say yes. Um, I think it's, sh is it Shane? Yeah, I think that's, that's right. Um, let me know. And if not, just tell the truth. You don't have to protect me. Um, 
Now I'm waiting. waiting. Shane, woo! There you go. All right. <laughs> I love that. It actually makes you feel a little bit nervous from time to time, but uh, uh, it's so much fun. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Avash, memorize that also. Good, good, good. Um, cool. I, I love it. It's like a little bit of a thrill uh, to try it. Okay, ah, this is fun. Thanks everybody for being so active today. Keep your comments coming. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed me putting my ass on the line and uh, trying that with uh, with Shane. Hit the thumbs up if you haven't already. Get subscribed to this channel and uh, uh, learn these techniques. It's really good. It's good for your brain uh, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, you know, don't uh, don't ever get embarrassed if you make mistakes. I've certainly made mistakes in my life, but there's something about, like there really is something super rewarding about at least trying. And then if I got it wrong, then I would think about it. What, what, would, what would have been wrong there? Um, why didn't that work and so forth? Uh, this, is, this is the skill. And, and, and I really, as much as I don't want to be a competitor or anything like that, I really admire the competitors because they put their butts on the line in front of other people. And when I went to compete, I put my butt, I was sitting there with Dave Farrell, cameras are on and people are watching, they know who I am. And I'm just like, bam, you've got to, uh, you've got to put it on, uh, on the line um, from time to time. <laughs> and it feels really good. Uh, I don't know what would have happened if I totally made an ass out of myself and failed, but uh, I didn't. And uh, so... It's great. And I can imagine people feeling quite damaged. So pick your battles and, uh, and only, uh, only do it when you're feeling good. But there's many, many, many ways to, to do this privately in your own head. Like when you're at a, at a uh, restaurant or whatever, you can practice with the name tags of people and just test yourself. If you properly carry around a memory journal, like I always do, you can just like do some self-testing and, and quickly on some paper. Uh, and it's great. And I do that too. Like I, I don't always feel like doing my job as a memory guy. And, uh, sometimes I will just let people go and not memorize their names. Other times I will just test myself anyway and not like do a big show about it. Um, and it's just good exercise. Anyway, the point being is this is a wonderful, wonderful tradition and you've got to put it into action in order to, to get, uh, out of it, what you're looking for. Um, all right. Avash says, that's the Hebrew word for vocabulary, uh, malem, something like outster malem. So it's been a long time since I looked at Hebrew. Uh, something like that. Uh, so what's your question with this, Avash? That's the thing. I, I get that you're working with um, uh, Hebrew, but what is it that you need help with please be specific um nilesh says what can you say about using color or story which is better it's not a better question it's a try both see which works better for you if one works better figure out what it is that works better about it and if one works less better figure out why it's not working better and work on improving that so acro says i just i finished the master class and will get you my final memory pals Plus, I started the supplemental section. Great stuff. Yes, you can use my info to post. I updated my bio too. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Really, really appreciate it. And I uh, can't wait to share uh, your story. And uh, I absolutely love that. Jason says, I want to know about cleaning memory palaces. All right. So Google magnetic memory method and Idris Zogai. Easy to spell, right? I-D-R-I-Z-Z-O-G-A-J, -I, I think it is. Um, and if I get enough, give me the links, then I'll pop it in. Uh, but you can look that up. Um, and I'll pop that in there for you, Jason. All right. So, Mademoiselle Esther Hadassa is here in the house. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your question. How to memorize vocabulary words 100 a day. Should I divide into four stage every six hours? How to put magnetic memory message system by one word into one thing, one station, one place? Can I put 25 words? 25 words in one station? Mm, I wouldn't even bother trying, but I possibly could. Let me think. Chitameva, Chitameva Maha. No, Chitameva Maha Dosham. Chitameva. Oh, Chitameva Maha Dosham. Chitameva He. Balakaha. Yeah, I think that most of my sentences are. Uh, 
Patanajanam. Yeah, they're more like uh, four to five words. I'm stretching this though. What was it? I was just working with this the other day. Uh, idam, Shri Ram, Kaunteya, Kshetram, E.T. Idam. Uh, what did I just say? Idam, Shri Ram, Kaunteya, Kshetram, uh, E.T. Uh, abhidyate. Yeah, so that's uh, abhidyate. That's seven words. That's probably the longest in another language that I have on a single station. But now that you mention it, filled with ming filled with mingled cream and amber. Yeah, I think probably seven words. No, no, wait a second. Filled with mingled cream and amber. I will raise this glass again. So that's what twelve words. I'm sorry. I'm thinking and counting. Whatever, I think it's 11 or 12 words. So it depends on the language. It depends on what you're doing and so forth. And then if it was just raw words, I don't know. I don't memorize raw vocabulary uh, that much in terms of just memorizing English. It's probably, if I was to go to a memory competition, I'd probably fail with words because of how I memorize words, which is usually foreign language words and not English words. So I don't know what words you're talking about. But um, if you wanted to memorize 100 words a day, then the, the reality is, is that you would want to um, build the memory palaces and then you would want to sit down and do it. And every six hours and so forth, I don't think that's the way to look at it. I think the way to look at it is have your memory palaces prepared in advance, multiple memory palaces prepared in advance. Then think about the actual words and how they're structured and do some organization and place them in particular patterns that really, really reduce the cognitive load. And then see how many you can do meaningfully with the time that you need to do recall rehearsal. And then depending on what you're doing, how you're doing it, then what you're going to, what you're going to want to do is, uh, you know, refine it as you go along and think about it because in, in foreign language, right? The word is good, but you also want to go back and add another, like a phrase to the word. And sometimes you'll just be able to do a phrase right away with the word. Um, and, and one of the problems I find with just memorizing sentences is that it's, it, it makes it harder to figure out the meaning of every single word, I find. So it's almost like it, it's half of, uh, half of one six dozen of the other. There's a lot of like little finicky little things and so forth. So you just got to pick your outcome and go for it and make it happen. And I, I wouldn't really think too much in the beginning of like 100 words a day. I would think, can I do 10 a day? Can I do five a day? And then build from there relative to your goal. And then in terms of 25 words on a station. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't see why you couldn't do it, but I just don't think it's the way to do it. And I don't think it's the skill to build when I think, well, probably the longest that I have is, you know, in English. But the problem with that example is if you understand like poetry and memorizing poetry, then you realize that you're, yeah, you, maybe you're memorizing 21 words or 12 words or whatever the heck it might be, but you're using two or three images to get it all in there. Right. So, and then in his foreign language, then sometimes you need like two or three images just for one syllable, you know, sometimes, not all the time, but the Sanskrit stuff that I'm doing, like some of it's really challenging and there's sometimes like really super elaborate images and then, you know, then when that's done, it's done and you go on to the next thing. So it depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it. And it, it's really, you know, as, as came up, I think it was from Paul, one of our Pauls, uh, you know, it's hard to enunciate. And that's why I have books. Uh, it's, it's really, really a thing that is articulated best when you have a bird's eye view of the actual thing. So if you don't have a book or a course, I recommend that you get one. And as far as I know, I'm the only guy who focuses on language learning. And I really can talk about it until the end of time. But the real secret uh, is all going to be unlocked by a number of things read an entire book at least, if not take the full video course, which is called How to Learn and Memorize the Vocabulary of Any Language. It's in the master class. And it is the most in-depth study of this in the world. It has basically brought me around the world, that course. And the reason why is because it works for people. And it will work for anybody who has two nuts rolling around in their head and can just simply sit down and follow some instructions. But we're not going to talk about it on a live stream and we're not going to be able to do it because, you know, you've got to actually follow through with the exercises. 
you can read one of the book versions and so forth. But I don't have one on Hebrew yet, uh, but maybe in the near future. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the real thing is, is to dive in, to figure out how this is going to work for you based on a full picture. A lot of people, I did some customer calls recently and uh, uh, talked to all kinds of people on calls, really heard what their experience was. And it was really shocking and surprising. It actually kind of uh, confused me because I would say to people, listen, uh, what, what do I need to do to improve this? And like 98% of them were like, nothing, this is perfect, don't change a thing. And then some other people were saying, um, well, I was expecting that I'd you know, just be able to graze and uh, get these techniques. And I'm just like, really? I mean, what ever gave you that idea? <laughs> It's like it's like people have some people have lost common sense. If you want to get something out of a course or a book, here's video one. Click play, take notes, do what the teacher said. Uh, click video two. Take some notes, do what the teacher said. Maybe the first thing the teacher said, which is what I say, is watch the whole course from beginning to end, then complete the exercises, and you know. Those are the people who get success the fastest, even though you got to sort of like hold back and uh, suppress your need for instant gratification a little bit. I know it's annoying myself because, you know, I want to take this course. I want to take that course and I just want to have the magic skill. Right. But it's not realistic. And the reality is, is that it's very difficult to get results from things if you don't put it into action. If you don't have the full bird's eye view and the full overview so that the actions you take are actually guided by enough detail so that those actions actually make sense to you and that you don't have to like go back a thousand times and think, oh, what would you say there? No, you've got it and you understand. And so I was really, really surprised and a little bit frustrated that there was no way to improve the training because the best students and the quickest students, they understand common sense, which is if you're going to take a course, take everything. Anyway, all of which is to say that you actually can enunciate these things. You can help people. I must have been able to because I get to do this work and show up year after year after year. We're going to be in seven years here of doing this full time. And uh, so it's working, but it's working best for people who have the wherewithal to read the book from cover to cover do the action, take the course from beginning to end, do the actions. And uh, it's amazing how that works. It's amazing. And yet it's just everyday common sense. So the real amazement is that people just won't take action. And I know now more from all these calls that I did that a huge part of them not taking action is they're worried that they're not going to uh, get the outcome that they're looking for. They're, they're worried that they don't know if it's going to work. They worry that it's, um, you know, blind on the other side. Guess what? That's life. <laughs> I mean, look, again, I was hanging out with uh, Jordan Peterson here. I got my little special VIP badge. Um, and this guy has inspired me a lot because he's helped me better explain to people how to move into the darkness based on uncertainty and how memory can help. And so that's the thing that I can improve really is helping people understand that uncertainty isn't going away and actually uncertainty is your best strength. It's your best asset. It is actually going to be the thing that sets you free if you can just learn to contend with it. So that's the, ultimately the answer to that. Whatever question is coming about Hebrew is take a course, read a book, figure out how to get yourself to sit down, butt in seat and, and really, really get a memory palace system working for you from soup to nuts, A to Z, and then just look at the words, find the patterns in the words, use the tools of bridging figures and word division and compounding and just get it done. There is nothing that is stopping anyone from doing this except for the contents of their minds and his representative, the evil Dr. Forget. This is what has people in its grips. Instant gratification is holding people back. The desire for it, the need for it. And it's just uh, absolutely sickening. And I think I know more now about why. And that's part of what this app is about. And Jordan Peterson told me straight, blunt, exactly what such an app will need in order to succeed for people. And uh, we'll see if that we can get it funded. Because I know... 
I, I, I mean, again, it has to be tested, but I know almost with certainty that it will work. I can see it working in my mind. And it may even be an app that I actually would use, even though I don't need it, and it would improve my own practice because of how it works. Anyway, Mademoiselle Esther Hadassa, that is the answer to your question in a roundabout way. Don't think too much about how to do it. Think more about what to do and then do it. Take action. It's very, very important. All right, so Acro says you were on, you were spot on, dude. You were on the spot, dude. Way to go. Excellent. And Acro says, have you taken the MMM? And uh, I believe that he has. Well, yeah, I know he has, but uh, I think he probably will say yes to that already because I remember reading that he said that he just finished it. So Avash, yes, he took it. Um, and he was telling us that he finished and is going to send his final memory palace. And Acro says, I'm late. What's a PAO? So Jason, thanks for jumping in. Person, action, object. It's a way of memorizing numbers. And you have access to that in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass uh, in the numbers course and math course. And also, you, I recently updated my 2019 full list of 00 to 99 and walked you through the thinking behind every single image and told the stories of how they came to be and so forth. So, um, uh, Avash has Michael Jordan for 37. That's a great one, actually. Yeah, Mike. Why didn't I think of that? That's a good one. Um, Avash says, can you give a hint on telesynoptic memory palace? Um, no, I can't, actually. That's uh, certainly a very advanced thing and something in the master class for master class students. And uh, you really need the magnetic memory method in action to 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 use it so uh, thanks for asking though really appreciate it um jason says the link please because otherwise others on the cell phone may have to close oh okay i didn't know you would have to close it so let's see if memory serves we're looking for idris zogai um, happy to do that for you actually Always like to test and see if we can get people motivated, taking actions, pumping, typing, all that stuff, because I know that it's good for your brain to take action. And why? Well, it's not just because taking action is good for its own sake, but it also helps with the second action and the next action and the action after that. So I popped that link in there for you. It should be showing up in the chat soon, and I uh, hope that helps you um, not have to uh, leave uh, to go and do it. And then if you have a way to bookmark it, excellent, excellent. All right. Um, Avash says, while reciting the Gita, did you place one whole sentence images in just one magnetic station or you place some in one station and another in the next? Yeah, it depends. Uh, but the way the Ribhu Gita is organized somewhat differently than the way that the uh, Bhagavad Gita is organized, or better said, the way that Gary Weber organizes it because he gives the Sanskrit and then he gives a transliteration and then a translation. Um, and so the Ribhu is very, very regular. The, stru the uh, extracts that he gives, there's 32 in total, or better said 30 with two capping verses. So 32 in total. Um, and so it's quite regular and I think he chose them for their regularities. And when I got the Bhagavad in Sanskrit, which is in his book, Dancing Beyond Thought, um, I thought, oh, this will just be like the same sort of structure, but it's actually quite different structure. And so then I thought, well, I'm going to need bigger walls if I want to do this on a station by station, uh, basis. So that thing that I just said, Edam, Shri Ram, Kaunteya, Kashet Ram, Eta, uh, Ad, Hibyate, um, that's, uh, on one station, so to speak, but the station is subdivided. Uh, and so... It's neat, and the and the, the art gallery really lends itself to this length, uh, because of the hugeness of of the walls or the height of the walls. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, th the answer to the question is uh, is yes and no. Sometimes it's one way, sometimes it's another. Uh, thanks for being here, Shane. Thanks for letting me know that you're off, and really thank you again for for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, it's related to the major system, and. Uh, all, all this is taught in a, in a very compressed way in the master class. All right, Paul says, how physically big of a palace do you generally use for something like 100 stations? I don't have 100 stations in memory palaces anymore. It's not worth it. Uh, 
so, but I used to do it in very small apartments. Uh, and it depends, it can be worth it, depends on the nature of the information. And you asked, just so I can have an idea of how compactly I should be aiming to make them. It's not, there's no, this is a question that has no answer. It, the answer is in your practice. So if you're following the good principles of Memory Palace creation, then you should be fine. But um, what you really want to think about is, do you want to use Memory Palaces properly? And if you do, then you're going to probably want to prefer smaller sets of information and then you're going to want to think about how you can segment memory palaces so that essentially memory palaces are memory palaces inside of memory palaces. And then you work in order to um, get the content on a room by room basis into long term memory and have that as a subset of the other surrounding information. And it depends on the nature of the information and so forth. So I know that that's not a clear answer, but really the answer is that it doesn't matter how big the place is. What matters is the nature of the project and how that you select memory palaces and create memory palaces if you need to, if you don't have them already there to select from, in order to reach your goal, right? So that's a bit tricky for a lot of people and it comes back to this uncertainty thing because that means that you might make changes along the way to get to your goal. But that's just the way that it is. That's just the reality of things. And if you if you dive in, then you're going to get stronger and better at making these decisions beforehand. But information and memory palaces will still throw you surprises, and you might take make some changes later, uh, depending on the nature of the project, the nature of the information, and so on and so on. So the beautiful practice is just to dive in and think of your existing skill with the techniques, think of what the nature of the project is, and then uh, 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 um, lay things out accordingly. So I hope that helps answer, even though it's, there's not really a way to directly answer it. Um, and so, yeah, like the last Mary Palace that I would have had that would add uh, anywhere reaching, it wasn't exactly 100 stations. This was for the Hiragana and the Katakana. And so it makes sense there to have that many stations because these are really small little symbols and sounds, right? Um, so that uh, that would be good to, to consider also, uh, is the size of the information. All right. Um, acro. Uh, All right, great. If you guys want to get together on Facebook, wonderful, wonderful. Paul says, could you maybe give a couple of examples of things you've used palaces for other than languages or names? Oh, sure. Um, quotes from books, dates of historical figures, everything. There's nothing that I don't uh, put in a memory palace. If you understand mnemonics, you know it's always a memory palace anyway. Even if you don't have a memory palace, you're still using spatial memory. And the more that you're aware that you're using spatial memory, even when you're not using spatial memory, so to speak, then the more you realize, I'm going to put this in a memory palace because it strengthens everything. Because all of them are spatial in nature. There's nothing that is spatial that isn't spatial in nature. Um, so also a couple of live streams ago, I just memorized some numbers that somebody threw out at me and uh, little symbols and stuff. It was K equals constant. Um, now it's starting to fade because I didn't repeat it, but it was K equals constant, I think, 8 comma 9, 9. Oh, no. Yeah, I think it was eight comma nine nine times ten cat's ear symbol nine. That's what it would have been. Yeah, um, cakes. I have no idea what that means, but that's what it was. I'm almost certain. So I memorized that stuff. That was in a memory palace. Even though I'm doing it live and you don't see the memory palace or whatever, as I'm making the imagery for it, it's going in a memory palace. So numbers. What else could there be? Oh, music. So. Uh, anything that I've memorized, like the complex little passages and stuff in Bach, just total memory palace stuff. Music is easy and fun when you can use a memory palace in combination with music. So I'm sure there are other examples, but I hope that, uh, oh, Chinese characters, those can be memorized in memory palaces as well. Um, what else? Dreams. Dreams can be memorized in memory palaces. You don't have to you know, get up and write in your memory journal. You can just memorize the dreams into memory palaces. Plot points from movies, etc. But he, Paul, the real answer to your question is that 
Everything is language in names. That's all you're memorizing. So when I memorize a dream, for example, what am I doing? Well, I'm memorizing the words that help me remember the dream. And the dream takes place in a plot that's understood in words and images and feelings and so forth. But the, the, the real answer to your question is to understand that part of what you're doing with memory techniques is you're taking semantic information and you're turning it into episodic information. Uh, and if you're really doing it well, you're translating semantics into episodic via uh, autobiographical memory, procedural memories, and some semantic memory as well, if not a lot of it. And you're just fusing them all together. And so all that you're memorizing is language and names, right? Because every word is a name that refers to something. So I gave you a bunch of examples, but really it's all just languages and names at the end of the day. How many days, asked Savash, did it take you to memorize as the Gita? Uh, well, let's be clear. I memorized parts of the Ribhu Gita, so 32 passages, uh, and I don't actually, I didn't, I didn't keep track of uh, how many days I was doing it, uh, so I don't exactly know. But it would have probably been over 32 days that I did the 32 verses in total. No, no, that wouldn't work. Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Uh, I, I thought when I started the the Bhagavad Gita that I should uh, note the journey, but I don't take any pleasure in like tracking it at the moment. And I don't, I don't, uh, I, the only time I date my memory journals is when I'm using them for dreams. So I'm not in this to like measure the, the time. This is just my personal project. Um, but it's not right to say that I did a verse a day because sometimes I did more than a verse a day. But then I would like stop for a couple of days and just really enjoy the meaning and the richness and the value of the new verse. And that was really rewarding to do uh, rather than just pile on some new thing. And here's why. A lot of people give the really bad advice that you should not memorize things that you don't understand. You should understand first and then memorize. This is terrible advice. Because just about everything that I memorized in the in the Ribhu Gita, I didn't understand. Some of it I still don't possibly probably understand. But I developed so much understanding precisely because I memorized it. And then I wanted to understand it more and spend some time with it and really roll it around like the fine wine of knowledge that it is. And uh, yeah, so like it took some time and I don't know exactly how long. And uh, to be honest, I don't really care. Um, and I think I'll probably be memorizing Sanskrit for the rest of my life and uh, really enjoying the ride. So ask me what I memorized uh, the next time we talk. Jason says, something I've started doing lately, interacting with the palace to attach images. Instead of just imagining a rope in a corner, imagine doing the work of drilling a hole, trying tying a rope to a metal hook. That's great. That's great. Uh, really good. There's so many things you can do. That's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Um, yeah, uh, you can also, you know, um, think about how one station connects to another, even without any encoded information there. That's a thing too. Avash said, your hair is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I imagine your hair is awesome too. Uh, Jason says, screwing objects into place, basically any effort and work to interact. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really good idea. Thanks for sharing that. Shlokum is here. Hello, Shlokum. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so let's look at some examples of PAO in action. I already, you know, talked about some people, but uh, here's uh, Marno Herman. He was on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast. He did 1,200 digits of pi. So congrats to uh, Marno for that. That was really, really exciting. If you haven't heard this episode, please do uh, listen to Marno talk about 1,200 digits. He used rote learning in the beginning. And then he switched to the magnetic memory method and things got a lot faster and easier for him thereafter. So uh, anybody wants the link, let me know. Otherwise, just search up Marno. And uh, when you're there, click those share buttons, 90 shares. I think we should get that a lot higher, don't you? I do. Um, just imagine yourself sharing it around and uh, make it happen. Another example, uh, you know, in my own thing, I memorized this. this uh, wait a second, we're skipping slides here. Uh, this is Paul Deary. If you want to watch Paul's memory improvement success demonstration, the link is in the description below. Actually, I think the Marno uh, thing, if, if I remember to do it, which I think I did, is also in the description below that episode. Anyway, if you want to watch this video with Paul, he does 100 digits in front of an audience. You see everybody clapping and cheering. Woo for Paul. Yeah. And I really honor him for 
doing that demonstration. There he is with the memory connection and the old Magnetic Memory Method print newsletter. Um, he was a great supporter of that. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for doing your uh, success demonstration. Amazing. And then I was just going to give you an example of this in everyday use. So I came across uh, uh, this proverb, and I thought, man, that's an amazing proverb. i got to memorize that. So I thought, well, I'm going to memorize the number, right? And uh, sure I am. So for me, uh, there's a couple of images that I can use for 18. One is uh, the transvestite Dr. Frankenfurter from the uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. And he's often dancing on a TV, not just any TV, but the TV from the movie Videodrome. And if you know that movie, then you know the TV I'm talking about. So it can be either or, or, or it can be both at the same time. It really depends. And then 13 is Hoover uh, Dam or J. Edgar Hoover or Hoover Vacuum Cleaner. And in this case, I just used the Hoover Dam as the memory palace and had Hoover sucking it in. And uh, I've got it on the next slide, but without looking to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. And uh, let's see. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. Right, so now on this imaginary, this is an example of an imaginary memory palace. I don't do this all the time, but sometimes I do. Never seen the Hoover Dam, but it's a dam. I get the idea of it, right? Um, and so this is laid out there. My friend, sister Andy, she's sending, uh, she's answering before she's listened, right? And before the B is putting honey on her email and it's going to the faulty towers where John Cleese is very ashamed. So those are just like very, very small number of images relative to the numbers of words. And the major, right, the PAO images, or one of them, is actually supporting the memorization of the phrase. This is really exciting, and I, I, you know, I want to see if this works more for biblical memorization when you want the actual verse number. What are the ways to turn, add images to a PAO where every single number is also a memory palace, right? Woo! So still got to work on that. Not sure how practical it is, but something I'm working on for uh, the next level. And there's an, uh, just an example for you of it in practice. And I hope you play around with that. Let me know if you do and if it works for you. All right. Jason says, Anthony, have you noted the relationship between building in the memory and what some schools of thought call astral or ethereal plane? Yeah, I've thought about that. And... Um, some of this I, I think I've connected with a little bit with, uh, with my, my memorization of Sanskrit and, and meditation project. And I think I know what, what they're talking about in ways that I never did before. I just don't think that there's anything astral or ethereal about it. I think it's just pure brain chemistry. And I have good reasons to conclude that. And there's going to be a lot of people who will not be satisfied with that, and that's fine. But... Um, I don't think it's rocket science, and I think it's well documented in science that there are neurochemical, neurophysical reasons why that people get these very, very good effects where they feel connected with something larger than themselves. I certainly do. And uh, I'll tell you that if I'm really connecting with God or the astral plane or any of that stuff, I feel very, very guided by God to call him out. And so one of the uh, ideas that I have is to write a book called Secular Spirituality, a.k.a. Swag. And Swag is spirituality without another god. And uh, I don't know if that's going to happen, but um, I really, really think that we can help a lot of people by saying, yeah, you know what, that astral plane stuff, it, it makes sense, actually, and you can experience it, but there's no moral, ethical reason to connect it with la di da woo-woo stuff. And... We should go after that, not only with Nietzsche's hammer, but something a little bit more intense because uh, we have that duty to do so. And I really admire Gary Weber for the things that he's doing in that direction as well. He's a little softer, but um, it's really, really important to understand that there's so many people who are locked out of religion, and rightly so, but they don't have to not have these wonderful, beautiful experiences of connecting with the divine or so forth. It's just that it's just normal. It's like something anybody can do. Uh, at least I have found that there's many, many scientific uh, reasons to that confirm my own experience in doing this. One of the things you might want to look at is the uh, Jeffrey Martin research on uh, what he calls PNSE, which is persistent non-symbolic experience. 
And that's certainly a good way of describing what I have, but I'm changing that in my new book to sense, which is um, sustaining and enduring neo-symbolic experience because I don't think they're right to say non-symbolic. I don't think there is any such thing as non-symbolism. Um, you would even say, like, if you know anything about Zen, you know that actually they are symbolizing the state that of non-symbolic experience, right? You, you have to be, you must be, you will be. It is absolutely... As long as a human brain is operating, it is symbolizing the experience of having the human brain. I don't see. I don't think there's any way around that. So uh, that's how I would answer that question. All right. Um, do, 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 do. Where are we? Where are we here? Great question, by the way, Jason. I really appreciate it. We're gonna talk in a minute about practice and ways to practice. And I've got a very, very special special tip just for you who have stuck around so long that is involving this. But I'll share that with you after we catch up with some of the chats and uh, stick around if you want some cool exercises. So Kyle, thanks for being here, Kyle. Good to see you. Hey, Anthony, do memory palaces work for everybody or do some people find it not successful because some people have worse memories than others? Interesting question. Everybody is a big word and I'm not really willing to generalize, but I can tell you that there are people who really won't put in the time or the effort to do it to either study it or practice it. And so obviously it won't work for them. Um, sad, but true. Uh, and I really don't know what to do about that, but I wish that they would, uh, they would, um, you know, come, come to the truth and the beauty and the glory of memory. And I'd like to do that as soon as possible uh, for them. And I believe everybody can because everybody's brain is governed by the same rules except for car accidents and other brain trauma and disease and so forth. But there's nobody who can't do it. They're doing it anyway. Uh, everything is based on the same fundamental laws that govern the brain. And the people who can't do it, who don't have a biophysical excuse, they are, um, you know, deluding themselves and just don't want to. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with not wanting to do something. I don't want to pack my own parachute and jump out of a plane. It's just... There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, same thing with uh, not using memory palaces. Uh, but to blame the technique or say that it doesn't work is just false. Uh, Gopal says, sir, you are great. I'm a big fan of you. Excellent. Thank you so much for your kind words. I'm a fan of you as well. Anybody who loves memory, I'm a fan of them. Nirmal says, why do you extend a simple line to a paragraph? Say it point to point. Um, not sure what you mean, but... Uh, Thank you for your question. Feel free to put it back in again. Avash says, if you have placed images of different topics on different palaces, like one topic on top of a building and another in another place and another place in a palace in a different country, how will you keep track? Great question, Avash. Um, basically, if you're using the techniques properly, you don't have to keep track of them. And that comes from recall rehearsal. So learn to use it properly and you won't have to... Uh, have that. I have a video I've written the script for and I'll be um, putting it out how to keep track of your memory palaces and talk more about that in the future. So make sure you're subscribed. Hit the thumbs up. If you haven't already, hit subscribe and uh, that video will come out soon. Make sure your notifications are on. Crone Woman Walking, I'm back. Good to see you again, Renee. Thanks for being here. So uh, for a beginner PAO system, I have 60 numbers so far. Wow. So it's like basically doubled what you had last time when you mentioned it. Do I need a memory palace for my PAO? That's a good question. Um, the answer is yes and no. I mean, I would, but if you're building it on the major, the major is already a kind of memory palace, right? So 61, do you, do you really need uh, to put that in a memory palace? Like knowing that six is ch, sh, j, right? Or j or all those different things. And that one is t, it's already a kind of memory palace, isn't it, right? Because you have a display of the numerical nature of numbers in your mind. Six is six, one is one. Then you go to 62. Do you really need to put it in a memory palace? Well, not really, because you know that, you know, six is ch, 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 and all that stuff. And then two is n, right? So, yeah, you can get away without it. Um, but I don't see why not to use a memory palace. Uh, it's totally up to you. Um, and then if you're like applying it to playing cards, well, those cards are kind of like a memory palace, aren't they? Um, that's a, some, a way to think about it. Let me know if you have more questions around that and uh, we'll dive in to answering it. 
Avash says, do you have meditation to just improve memory without using memory techniques? Yes. Sit, just to sit, and pay attention to your breathing. There's good reason to believe that that, at least four times a week, will give you a memory boost. It will also help increase focus and concentration, which is needed to use more advanced techniques. And uh, that'll be awesome for you. Um, let's see. Crone Woman Walking says, I think I agree as it gets us in touch with our humanity and not be ashamed. One of the reasons why I'm disappointed in Ray Kurzweil's books. Great. I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty much disappointed in, in a lot of uh, the Kurzweil stuff, but there's no doubt that he's a great innovator of tech and a great thinker. But the whole thing about the singularity that I don't think he understands is that this is the singularity. <laughs> it ain't coming. It was here from the beginning. Like uh, how that's not clear, I don't know. Um, and there's a lot of people all running around about the singularity and it's just like, relax, it's here already. Uh, we've been in it forever. All right. Gopal says, sir, I have ADHD. How do I focus on my studies? Focus on your studies, not on your problems. Focus on what you're going to do. Make some time to do it. Practice these techniques. You don't need it. My good friend, Jonathan Levy, very, very successful entrepreneur, very, very successful teacher of memory techniques himself. He's got ADHD. He doesn't let it get in his way. He focused on his studies. And uh, you might want to listen to my interview with him. So um, check that out, search it up on the uh, podcast. We go deep into his ADHD, but just focus on your studies and not on the problem. Find the solutions. Mademoiselle Esther Hadassa, Anthony, which foods are good for our brain? Do you fast to make your memory sharp? If fasting, how long? Yes, I have fasted for several years. Uh, I'm not fasting now, but uh, I've put in a lot of time into fasting and I normally fasted for between 16 to 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours. Uh, but I never did 48 hour fast for, 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 for very often. Um, yes, I did find that it sharpened my concentration and my focus and my memory. Um, and, uh, in terms of the foods that are good for your brain, talking a lot about that in the new book. So please stay tuned. In fact, there's a whole, uh, big shebang about that in the new book for helping people understand the, uh, sattvic, rajasic and tomasic foods, uh, that they can play around with. Uh, and, and, and how to properly do an elimination diet and a rotation diet. Avash says, Crone, you definitely need a memory palace for PAO. You're placing one station and another and another. Station. Okay, thanks for that, Avash. I don't know if I totally agree that you definitely need one, but that's what I uh, talked about. Vibehav is here. Good to see you. Oh, man, I want to visit Delhi like you don't believe. Uh, like you wouldn't believe, I mean to say. Bye bye bass. Sir for PAO created for zero to nine numbers. So can we combine those for two digit numbers? Yeah, you can combine a zero to zero to nine a zero to nine with that. But I'd just rather you do a zero zero to ninety nine and have both because it's helpful. When you have three digits, you can use your zero zero to ninety nine and you can use your zero to nine. Or when you come up with a zero nine, then you have you have like the best of both worlds. Gopal says, does no fap increase focus and memory? That's an interesting question. I would think so, but I think not at the end of the day. I think both. It depends on how you use your non nofap, so to speak. So here's here's the thing, and I'm thinking like, what's the non controversial way to to just write an article or a book about this? Because the reality is, if you don't have a romantic partner in your life, then you're going to face normal human drives that interfere with your focus and concentration. And uh, that's just not good and it's not necessary. So the problem with things like FAP and uh, all the associated stuff is that there's a hysteria out there about addiction to uh, the internet and, and it's true to a certain extent. But by the same token, everything in moderation has its place or almost everything in moderation. So if you can just, in a disciplined manner, deal with your humanity when you don't have a romantic relationship that helps you do that, then why should you sit there and struggle with, you know, uh, normal humanity, normal animality, normal randiness, when you can just take care of it, get it done, and go on with your day? Uh, I think that NoVap is asking for mental barriers 
that don't necessarily need to be there. So I need to think it through a little bit more. I've done NoFap challenges uh, from time to time and never really thought that it was really worth it when it comes to focus and concentration. If anything, it's sadistic and it's self-punishing and it doesn't really help. Uh, but I can see how for some people it would help them create discipline. I don't know at the end of the day. I'm not Dr. Sue Johansson, if you know who that is. <laughs> I'm not any of those uh, sort of professionals. But uh, I think at the end of the day, it's it's a, it's a here or there question. It really depends on you. And uh, give us give us an update on your own challenge if you do it. In my own case, I've done the challenges, and all that I found was it was a recipe for creating mental barriers that I was supposed to be escaping, and I didn't escape them. And also, you know, just from a um, from some of the things I've discovered in Advaita Vedanta, they basically say the same thing. Like you're going to have quote unquote sin issues, like the urge to do certain things. And there's going to be things that actually aren't really sins They're They're going to like every action is going to create a reaction. So really the question is, what is the action and what is the reaction? And are you willing to deal with the reaction? And is there a way to quote unquote, get away with things in moderation? And in some cases, yes. With alcohol, I was never good at moderation. I drank like a fish, and ultimately, I just had to get rid of it. And I never, you know, I haven't drank since since October two thousand fifteen was the last time that I drank. And you know, I was never terrible, but uh, I just didn't have self control uh, in terms of when the drinking started, and then go crazy and feel like crap for the next two days. So I just got rid of it, right? Um, and because alcohol is not a normal, natural human need like a sexual drive then it just disappears and it's not even an issue. I can't even imagine drinking alcohol anymore. The odd time I'll like hear some song and I'll remember seeing the band play it at a concert and I'll be like, remember, yeah, that was a great drunk beer, but um, it goes away real quick. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of FAP, I just don't think, it, uh, I, 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 but I have to look at it more. All right, Jignesh is here. Best techniques for new language learning and speaking fast. I mean, speaking fast really like this. Like, blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't think speaking fast is the goal. Speaking clearly, being understood, understanding others. That's the goal. So what I would do is learn the magnetic memory method and, uh, you know, maybe follow some of the other really good language teachers like Ollie Richards uh, and Benny Lewis and so forth to get some uh, more techniques. Crone, a woman walking, says, I found enough palaces in my house for an ersatz memory palace. In my case, a memory dungeon. All right, I like this. Ersatz memory palace. Amazing. And you say, thank you, I agree. Um, I think those of us who read actual books and memorize will use actual AI better in my humble opinion. Yeah, well, interesting. Yeah, I think so. Not only that, but we will have the wherewithal to see what's going on because we're not so deeply invested in it. We're not so dopamine hooked to it, which kind of contradicts what I was saying about, you know, taking care of your animal urges with FAP and so forth. But um I don't think so. I mean, if you do it with moderation, and that's the whole thing about what digital fasting is about, you'll be away from it. Um, in any case, I don't. I don't know all the things that uh, Kurzweil has written and so forth. But again, like I really admire some of his innovations. But at the end of the day, it's just like there's so much profitability in him uh, being right, so to speak, about the singularity because of how it woos people and it's this fantasy thing. All we know is that humans are really bad at predicting the future. And uh, they have a really good, strong track record of failing at predicting the future. And uh, we don't know what's coming. And so we better just be in the best possible position to survive based on what we do know at the present moment and let go of the outcome because that's the best thing that we can do. All right, so I'm caught up with the chats. Let's dive in to some ways that you can practice your PAO list once you have it. So obviously the banking thing would be really good, personal security, speaking about AI, you know, does, there are people using you know, technology to try and get into your bank. And then, you know, what if you don't know your bank account number, your house burns down, how are you going to get in? Oh, I know you memorized it. So practice with your, uh, PAO to, um, memorize your banking info. Great way to practice. Now I said, I would show you this. If you really want to practice really fast, get some index cards, write a two digit number on each one and just practice memorizing. So zero five. Oh, I didn't even memorize what that last one was. I think I saw 35. Was it? Let me know. Did somebody notice? Yeah, it was 35. So, you know, there would be the mailman from, sorry, there would be the mailman from 
Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Mr. McFeely. And then we have 05. And so that would be Sal from Dog Day Afternoon. And we'd stick those two guys in a memory palace. One would be fighting with the other. And so then we'd have, oh, I want to shuffle this a little bit better so we're not getting too many due digits. But then here we would have Shiva and so on. And so shuffle, 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 mix, 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 mix. And then uh, memorize, memorize, memorize. And then test, 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 test. How to test? Well, don't sit there and go, okay, it was 35 and uh, 05 and 08. No, no, no. Um, well, yeah, you can do that. But don't, what I mean to say is don't go 35, uh, yep, uh, 42 or whatever, or 05 in this case and 08. Um, don't do that. Put the deck away, write it out here, then go check the record, give yourself a score. And uh, if you made any mistakes, then test. So that's a really good way to get fast. It's just like practicing with playing cards, except for there's just numbers on the cards. Then you can memorize dates, anniversaries, phone numbers, the periodic table, music. I talked about how to do that. Zero, zero to 99 maps out onto many instruments very, very well. Uh, mnemonic calendar, prices, populations, formulas. There's lots and lots of things that you can do. There's so many, so many exercises. Just invent your own exercises. But those are a couple to get you started. So that's um, what I suggest. Make a PAO. I suggest you make it based on the major. I suggest if you really want the brain exercise, do both. Do Hotel Dominic and do the, the Dominic or the Millennial uh, uh, PAO or um, something like the Ben system, etc. Like there's lots and lots of things that you can play around with. Just pick one and do it. And pay, pay, pay it its due. Let it go out over time and uh, really enjoy the process. So that's the way that to do it, you know, is just pick one and stick with it and get it done. Like a uh, crone woman walking. She's now, you know, I think it's, wait, what, a week, week and a half since that you reported in last time and you've doubled your amount and, and ready to go for the next uh, 40 to go. And it's amazing, beautiful. So it doesn't take that long. All right, Vibe is, oh, yours truly is here with love from India. Good to see you, yours, tr yours truly. Thanks for saying hello. Vibav says, sir, how to encode in high information at a single station. Make sure you can encode one piece of information at a station, then go to two, then go to three. Build your confidence progressively. Progress towards better and more. Yours truly says, I want to know the best ways to study for an entrance. An entrance, uh, an entrance to a door? I mean, I assume you mean an entrance exam, but uh, what do you think I'm going to recommend, having been on these live streams many times? What do you think I'm going to recommend the best way to study for an entrance exam? Uh, maybe you can answer that question yourself and tell us what you think I would say based on how many times that we've seen you on a live stream. Now, don't take that the wrong way, but it's a bit of tough love. And uh, I really am curious what you think that I would tell you to do. Um, and if the answer is wrong, then we'll correct it. Jay says, this makes learning dates for my history exams so much more fun than just trying to drill it into my head. Oh, yeah, it's so much more fun. Uh, I heard from someone recently how much fun he's having just laying in bed and running through this stuff. And it's just like amazing. It's like going to Disneyland. Paul asks, how would you go about structuring a palace and stations for memorizing populations of countries? Would you nest palaces somehow or make one relatively large one? So, Paul, thanks for that question. As I think I suggest, I would not make a, a large one at all, uh, at all. Large memory palaces are not in my practice anymore, um, and I don't recommend them anymore because I see a lot of people putting a lot of barriers into their path by making large memory palaces, and so that's a good one. I'm going to answer this in a little bit more detail because there is a couple of ways that you could do this, but... Um, any last questions, start pumping them in now because we're going to call it a day in about 10 to 15 minutes. Thanks, everyone, for being here. If you hear the call that we're coming to an end and make your mass exodus, but if you want to listen to the uh, full suggestion I'm going to give to Paul here, stick around. Really appreciate that. If you don't have our uh, free course at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT, please go ahead, grab it now. Really going to benefit you a great deal go deeper into the concepts that we have. And uh, again, any last questions, pop them in now because I'm going to answer Paul and anything that comes in. And then sayonara for today. Um, that didn't look that good. Sayonara. <laughs> I think that's the right word, isn't it?
All right. <laughs> so imagine you just start with 10 countries. The countries are in alphabetical order, and you're going to then put the numbers with the names of the countries. And imagine that you go back and you add the state capital too. So 10 at a time, country, number, next country, number, next country, next number, next memory palace. But don't go to the next memory palace until everything in the first one is in long-term memory. There's a couple of reasons to do that. First, you're going to want to get it into long-term memory. So a small set is going to be better than overdoing it. Second, it's going to give you more clues about how to encode the next ones because as you do this, you actually see relationships and those relationships compound progressively as you go. So you may not feel that until you actually do a large project like this, but one of the cool things about this long project that I'm on with the Sanskrit is that I then like have this teleportation effect, so to speak, where I can just zoom in things from another things. So like Yatad comes up and I can actually just link it to this other place and don't have to encode it again. It's hard to explain, but basically there's some sort of teleportation effect that goes on between things. So it, 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 there's still like kind of a, a placeholder, so to speak, but um, it just, so yeah, get, but it only works if the original thing is in long-term memory. So that's that. Now, the other thing that you could do and I don't think this would be as efficient, but you could do it. And I've never never really done anything like this, so I don't know how it would work. But imagine you organize all of the populations by a, a number, right? So maybe there's similarities between 15 million, right? You could have all the 15 million ones, or ones that start with 15, better said, have them progressively from biggest to smallest that start with 15. This is a little bit of sort sift and screening that I don't necessarily think is worth the time, but it is something you could do. Um, and then take 10 of them, stick them in a memory palace, same thing, and progress through the numbers that way. Uh, you could also not use w uh, number similarities, but you could use uh, by size, by, by geographical size or by size of population to help you order them. And, you know, if you read some of Dominic's uh, books, he talks about like the, the world's biggest oceans and tends to go from biggest to smallest if memory serves. But um, really, at the end of the day, you got to ask yourself, like, what are you going to do with that kind of knowledge when you could be memorizing knowledge that helps you save the world? Um, just a suggestion. Uh, take it or leave it. But that's what comes to mind. Uh, so I hope that helped you out, Paul. Let's see here. Jay says, yeah, it's hilarious when I explain it to my family and friends. Yeah, I mean, it's so much fun. A lot of humor in this. Crone Woman Walking. I make a game out of remembering names while watching TV shows, and now we'll be listening for numbers. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, one of the things is, is when you have a 00 to 99, numbers jump out at you a lot more. It's so much fun. Amazing. Vibab says, Memory Palace is the answer. You got it, my friend. What else would there be? So you got an entrance exam, right? Well, First of all, you should just have memory palaces. The amount of times that uh, you know uh, that uh, that we go through this, if you don't have memory palaces yet, a solid, massive memory palace network as big as you can get it. What are you doing? What are you waiting for? Get in there. Get this done. The benefits are so clear. Not only do you have a greater palette to work with, so that you can just start memorizing information like crazy, but you're going to have better focus and concentration because of the exercise. You're going to get exercise for your autobiographical memory, for your episodic memory, probably some of your semantic memory and so forth. Maybe your figural memory too, if you really do all the exercises that I teach. And bam, bam, bam. It's just like the most amazing thing. So this is this is like totally, totally so clear. And it's amazing that people don't even have this done yet sometimes. So get it done. Um, then you've got an entrance exam. So what, did I, what do you do? Well, what's on the exam? What should you memorize? Well, probably there's a textbook, right? Probably that textbook is filled with clues, such as indexes and chapter headings and bullet points at the ends of chapters. And probably there's a professor or a teacher who you could go and say, hey, can I look at a previous exam? Or maybe there's a secretary of the department. Can I look at a previous exam? Or maybe there's an internet website. Can I look at a previous exam? Google. And then, uh, you know, yada, 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 bada bing, bada bang, boom, boom, boom. Now you know what to memorize. Memorize it. Memorize it until it's bulletproof. Then go into the exam. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, so many people have done this, and it's just amazing. 
Amazing, amazing, amazing. Boom, 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 boom. Let's see here. Samanthreddy, how you doing, my friend? Thanks for being here. Can we make an infinite memory palace for storing large data? Well, no, because people die. Um, but <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, I think that you can possibly think of how to extend a memory palace and in practice make it play out. And I think that we've sort of talked about some ways that you could do that today already. So maybe watch the replay because uh, something that I suggested to Crone Woman Walking will be the answer to that uh, when we think about infinity. So uh, if you go and check that out, there's your answer. Uh, not to be too mysterious, but, you know, we got to get people uh, working for their answers one way or the other. Yours truly says, also I'm interested, can colors be used in memorizing verbatim texts? Can colors be used to create a language where words are not used, where we assign colors to words? Sure, of course, of course. Um, actually, you got to listen to the episode uh, with Dave Farrow, who's the guy I sat and competed with once upon a time. He talks about colors, and he's really, really kind in sharing what he does with colors. So typey type type, Magnetic Mary Method, and Dave Farrow, D-A-V-E-F-A-R-R-O-W. Um, great guy, too. I really like him. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, Suman Thready says, how long can we retain data in a Mary Palace? As long as you want, my friend, as long as you want. Um, noting that we, we do die. <laughs> and thank goodness for that. <laughs> Paul says, wasn't actually planning on memorizing that, just wanted a specific thought process that I could generalize for myself. Good, got it. But I think the point was important to make because a lot of people, they uh, memorize stuff that has absolutely zero actual practical value. Paul says, do you have a large backlog of empty palaces that you've planned but haven't used yet? Oh, yes, I do. Um, so that's the thing. I just constantly create memory palaces, constantly. And there's a large backlog of them. And then when I think, oh, what's going to be the memory palace for this? There's an idea. Uh, and it's only possible because I actually just go through the steps of creating them, draw them out, make, make sure that they're just fresh on my mind do regular, at least once a year, a review of the main technique for generating memory palaces, which is in the free course at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT. And uh, Hashir is here. Hashir, my friend, in Karachi, Pakistan. Thank you so much for uh, being here and saying hello. But I am afraid you've joined us at the end, my friend. So we will have to catch up next time. But I want to thank everybody for being here today. What a great session, super interactive. Sorry we got started with a technical glitch there, but um, always moving forward, onward, and, uh, you know, we are here to be warriors of the mind, as Tony Buzan called them. And for those of you in the know, there you go. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, for being here. Really, really appreciate it. What a great session. So many wonderful questions, and I hope that this helped you out. Go out there, learn a PAO, and... Just get it done. It's so rewarding. It's so rewarding. It's unbelievably rewarding. It's absolutely rewarding. And it's going to be the thing that rewards you for the rest of your life. This is the kind of thing that you can absolutely crush it with, master it, and it will help you get a better job. It'll help you pass your degrees. It'll help you learn a language, even if it doesn't seem like it will, it will. And we can talk about that another time. But just as a simple example, you know, learning the tones in Chinese. What tones are? It? Oh, three and four, 34. I have an image for that. Bam, bam, bam. So it's just endlessly rewarding. And uh, it's amazing what can happen for you. And uh, as as Crone Woman Walking here says, it's helping uh, her brain, uh, save her brain from the night shift. And I know you work the night shift. And, you know, that's another beautiful thing about this. So much of what you need to develop in terms of these skills can be developed while you're doing other things and make you better at those other things, right? So, you know, I'm at the gym and I'm sitting there in my memory palaces and everybody else is like, ns, ns, ns. I don't know what they're thinking about. They're texting their girlfriends. They're scanning through for new girlfriends, uh, whatever those Tinder yada yada stuff is, or or they're chatting and jiggly jiggly. What? could be rehearsing stuff in your memory palaces that make your life better and make it better for you to make the lives of others better. Amazing. And uh, I really, really honor uh, you, Crone Woman Walking, for 
saving your own brain during your night shift and becoming a better professional as a result. And I honor everybody who does that because this is the fastest, easiest, most effective and fun path to improving your memory and becoming a better professional, which makes you a more effective professional. And what we need in the world today is more people who are absolutely fearless and can go out and be more effective because they have the confidence to do so. And that confidence is not coming from some delusion, but coming from real competence. And so if you want to be a competence person, competent person, I'm not even competent with the word competence or competent, but in any case, <laughs> we're getting there. We're working. If you want to be a competent person and really, really grab life and really enjoy and be suckered by it. Sucker, that's not a very common word anymore these days, is it? But if you just want to absolutely be nourished every minute that you exist, get this free course if you don't have it already, or get the master class if you don't have it already. Dive in, invest in yourself, and make sure that you are absolutely, absolutely in control of your mind because you're the only person who can be and this is a way of creating better mental organization better clarity better focus and all the wonderful beautiful things that we all want and crave and need in order to be our highest possible selves so one last chat here harry with his thumbs up avash saying looking forward to my videos great avash look forward to seeing you in the master class Mademoiselle Esther Hadassa. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Mademoiselle Esther Hadassa. And Daniel says, I've used the low-key, low-c, low-chi method to make more lists, 1 to 20 objects, 1 unknown, 6, 6 pack, 10 teenager, 21 to 30 bodies, parts, car, 31 to 40 bumper, motor, tail, exhaust, till 100. And I exercise these with the minus 3, plus 3 method. Amazing. I was just doing that exercise today, actually. And thank you, Daniel, for sharing all of that. And, uh, since the Deutsch Übergens with your German name, uh, let, let me know sometime. But for now, that's all the time that we have. Thank you, everybody, again. Always a blessing to see you here. Wow. Om Tat Sat. And until we have a chance to speak again, as I always like to say, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.